Well, howdy everybody. Welcome to Stress Free Lunch. I'm your host, Bill Whittle, and it is uh, Thursday night for the Thursday night show for the first time in forever. Uh, but the good news is, uh, in the past when I've had to cancel, I just canceled. Uh, for the last several months, if I had a problem on Thursday nights, I just rescheduled it to Friday, so better late than never, I guess. Um, it's good to see everybody, as always here. We have such fun, uh, our little uh, group here in the live chat session. So if you haven't seen the show live, uh, you can check the Facebook page. And um, it's an experience you won't soon remember. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, it's good to be here. I'm going to make another uh, sterling attempt to get through these, uh, these questions again. I'll get started on them earlier this time. Um, let's see if there's anything in particular. I do have one quick thing to show you. It's not very much. No, I don't think anything comes to mind right away. Um, so uh here's the thing i uh just quick animation update just so y'all know i haven't been relaxing or anything um oh yeah that, uh, that's interesting uh, i noticed in the comments before we started that there's some talk about um that well that apparently there's going to be a falcon heavy mission and a bunch of people going down to florida to uh, watch the launch it's a is it an asteroid mission uh, it's pretty um it's pretty impressive, the Falcon Heavy and the twin booster landing stuff. That would be something to see. By the way, you know, these planetary missions, I've been growing up with these things since, um, let's go into Psyche. 16 asteroid, 16 Psyche, 16th asteroid discovered. Um, having grown up with all of these uh, planetary missions, essentially all of them, uh, I, I remember Mariner 9 at Mars, and I very well remember the Voyager um, missions. Pioneer, I remember when Pioneer 10 took its first pictures of Jupiter and how impressive they were. They're just, just look at them now, it's just shocking. Anyway, um, oh, Psyche's the one that's worth so much. Is Psyche the, uh, the, solid, um, the solid platinum asteroid? That's awesome. Anyway, um, I remember for most of my life with these missions going to Mars and going especially to the outer planets, thinking, my God, I launched in 1987, and, and we expect to reach Jupiter by 1993. That's six years from now. And it was so frustrating. And I thought, well, you know, it is what it is. I guess you can't, you know, just, obviously it's all about Delta V, and it's all about conserving energy, and the gravity assist. That's just a sign that you just don't have enough, you just don't have enough Delta V. You're just, you're just... You're, you're, it's like a paper airplane that you've launched and you just got to get it on the right currents and it'll eventually drift its way out there. Anyway, along comes New Horizons, right, which is the one they sent out to Pluto. And this one, instead of getting to Jupiter in four or five years, this said it was going to get to Pluto in five or six or something. It was at Jupiter within less than a year, I want to say. Um, it's, um, it can be done, you know, it's just like everything else. It's just like everything else. It's not a question of the technology, it's a question of the will. You could put a small um, a small uh, atomic rocket on one of these babies and we'll see you at Jupiter in two and a half months. Anyway, so uh, that, that I don't think, I don't see any way I'll be able to get down there for the launch, although you never know. It's not, it's not too far from, from Orlando or from Fort Lauderdale, so maybe. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, Dave Big Boutte says that Juno's images of Jupiter look like a Van Gogh painting. I have to tell you, if you if you've been following planetary imagery the way I have, um, when Galileo brought back the pictures of Jupiter, I thought, wow, that's incredible. And then New Horizons took a couple as it went swinging past, and then I saw the images from Juno, and I actually thought to myself, you know, that's too much. You guys, whoever's playing with this, you need to turn turn down the awesome just a little bit. It's it's actually almost too much uh, to believe, but the stuff down underneath the poles, it's it's, it's mind boggling. And and I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a there's an animation of of Juno in a in because it's got a very elliptical orbit. Orbit. There's imagery of it down at the very bottom, and it gets really close to Jupiter, goes swinging out again. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. Yes, Bart's Treasure says a small 1G ion nuclear engine and live images from Alpha uh, Proxima, I guess it means Proxima Centauri, in just 10 years. 
Well, that doesn't make sense because it could take four years for the message to get here. You probably get the probe there in 10 years. In any event, um, yes, let's, uh, let's do it. Uh, but we're back in the world of uh, science fiction. Uh, aside for a moment, we're going to uh, dip back into the world of fantasy. I just have one more animation thing to show you. Before I show it to you, I'll tell you um, what uh, I think what um, what it's about. So, um, having redone the beginning of this thing to make it so much better because it's so much more political and so much more interesting, I moved a lot of the stuff that normally happened inside the castle forward. So we've got the two guys seeing all of these creatures and I've rendered them out, the insane and the, you know, the open, fatally open-minded and the willfully blind, you know, and all that stuff. Six years travel. Well, that's, that six year travel is hitting, hitting what, 0.8C, something like that. Anyway, um, so uh, I thought, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them start in a burning forest, which I showed you guys a couple weeks ago. And the thought was, all right, this is what Democrats do to cities. They turn them into smoking ruins. This, this, this forest is Detroit. And then I thought, because I got these guys walking down the hill, I'll show you that in a second. It's, it's the very first dialogue out of the box. It's, it's included in this clip I'm gonna show you. And, and Zoe looks around and talks about, this used to be a beautiful valley once. And then, um, I decided what I would do is uh, I will do a flashback. I'll do a flashback of a green lush forest with with Zoe as a young, like a young prince, you know, and he'll be looking around and he'll see all these green plants and all this and all this stuff because that way it'll be a real powerful indication of this is what it used to look like. And then this happened. What happened? Not what happened, good sir knight. Who happened? Name them. I cannot name them. So, um, what I'm going to show you is I decided I'd do the flashback and only the flashback in Unreal 5 because Unreal 5 has been released. So, i um, just going to show you again, this is just the uh, first one's a lighting test. The second one's got a little uh, glitch in it after we render it, but get you close enough. So, here are, uh, here are two passes uh, through the same uh, valley, presumably. Um, the first one, I probably should have put them in the, in the reverse order. Uh, the first one is a, a lighting test. It's all it is. Um, why aren't you moving, you? Uh, of uh, there we go. The first one's kind of just basically a lighting test, but the first one is Unreal Five, and uh, and then the second one is what the forest that he grew up in looks like once the Democrats are finished with it. So uh, here you go. That's Unreal 5. And I had him walking just to get a sense of it. And this forest was alive once. Very beautiful. The air was sweet. The leaves on these trees made an emerald canopy over the entire glen. Songbirds flitted about everywhere. The game was plentiful in all directions. Everybody's kind of uh, doing the boy crush out on, on Zoe. Looks like a supermodel. He, he looks good. Looks good. And the textures, you know, the gold and everything, golden brown, it's fantastic. And yes, he can act. He's a very good actor. He's a fine actor, much better than I am. Um, but he comes down the hill. The way it looks is he comes down the hill, he looks around. He said, this used to be, uh, this forest was alive once and, and very beautiful. And, he talks about a couple things, and he said there was a, a emerald canopy overhead, and that's when we're going to cut to Young Zo looking up and see all these beautiful trees and stuff. And he says, you know, and, and and there was a, you know, there was game was plentiful, and he'll look off to the right, not not like eating out of his hand or anything, but you know, I don't know a couple hundred yards away, I have a giant, you know, buck deer and a, and a doe, and um, and so it's only a couple shots, but it. It makes it so it makes it so much stronger when you go back to the fire after that. Um, you realize, wow, something ruined this really, really, really nice place, and and my character wants to know what, and he says it wasn't what, it was who. And I said, well, who? 
He won't tell me. So that finally, when you get to the big reveal at the end of the castle, when it's Democratic Party headquarters, that was the only punch in the whole first version of this. Now it's the payoff. So anyway, um, I thought I thought that uh, Unreal Five looked really good. And the problem actually with Zoe in 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 that Unreal Five thing is he actually, since I I ran him through the uh, digital deager, kept the same geometry. You can in MetaHumans you can basically dial up and down the skin how old you want it to look. I took him way down to like being a teenager. Um, I'll get to that in a second, Marisha. And um, and his skin is too smooth now. It looks a little artificial. I'm tempted to go put a couple, it's a couple more, I don't know, just a little more something texture because he, he, his skin looks so good it looks artificial. I think I'll, that's an easy thing to do. No, not too tough. I had to figure out Unreal 5, which took a little time, but anyway, I think it's worth it and kind of fun. And I am very, very much looking forward to using Unreal 5 uh, in the future. Um, I am going to show you something that I had not thought about earlier, else I would have prepped it, but this is the, the last we'll talk about on the animation side of things. Um, we have a live comment section here, and, and in the live comment section, we often have uh, kind of, you know, star players and stuff, and one of them is this uh, person named Marusha Dark, many others, Dave Big Booty and, and CP Tomes and all the rest of them. But um, I kept talking about Unreal Engine, and she was saying, can I see some love for Unity, which is another um, an, another game engine. And I thought, oh, you know, okay, Unity's okay. And then I saw, um, I thought, yeah, it's it's all right. It's, it's obviously not a match for Unreal. It's not, not able to do the MetaHumans thing. And then, um, uh, what was it, March 21st, so a month ago, uh, Unity released something that blew my freaking mind, and I'm going to show it to you now before we move on, only because it, it just keeps coming back to me that, that this is not only the right time to be in this particular space, the best part of it is every day that goes by, things get better and better and better and better. So give me one second just to download this because this is mind-boggling, I think. All right, there it is. Convert, run, download, do your thing, baby. Yeah, this is this is mind-blowing. So uh, the, the people that you saw, the, the face of Zoe that you saw uh, is a, is a um, Unreal Engine, uh, I don't want to call it a plug-in exactly, an asset called MetaHumans. And I thought, man, these things look great, and they do look great. And I thought, well, I sure I'm glad I went with Unreal because uh, Unity can't really keep up with this. <laughs> and then uh, here's what Unity put out a month ago. Um, brace yourselves. I'd like The opening is a little cartoony, but the second half, uh, the second half is real, real, real good. Oh, there's no sound on the video? Oh, I'm idiot. I muted the wrong one. Hang on. I muted the wrong source. I'm an idiot. Here, try again. Yeah, this forest was alive once. Very beautiful. The air was sweet. The leaves on these trees made an emerald canopy over the entire glen. Songbirds flitted about everywhere. The game was plentiful in all directions. Okay, brace yourself, kids.
have in my head everything that anyone has ever known. You have in your heart everything anyone has ever felt. Power Mind is given only to those who dare to lower themselves and pick it up. Don't you give me that saucy look, you highly organized collections of ones and zeros. Um, so uh, that is Unity's counterpunch to um, to metahumans. And I saw metahumans a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago. I said, that's unbelievable. And this is like, this is a significant increase over that. Now, somebody had said in the comment section, that um, Unity bought Weta Studios, which is, I think, the best special effects house in the world. That's the one in uh, New Zealand that Peter Jackson set up. But um, both of these, if you had told me that, that Weta had bought Unity, I wouldn't have been surprised by that. But the fact that it's the other way around, because Unity is essentially open source public property. Somebody's running Unity, and, um, and Unreal has got a bundle of money and both of them, uh, uh, Unity because it was built this way and Unreal because of just very smart, uh, very smart marketing. Unreal Engine is free and a lot of the good assets are free. You just hear. And the license you sign when you download the software is if you make a game and the game makes money, after a certain amount, you will pay them 5%. And if you, don't, if you want to do nothing but make movies, knock them out. You don't owe them anything. And so, um, so I am really, really looking forward to seeing uh, what Unity's got up their sleeve. And this is exactly what we want. We want, uh, we want this, this is how things progress, is when you've got Apple and Samsung, you know, really going at it. Yeah, Dave Big Booty's got it right. Uh, Death to Hollywood, exactly. Um, and uh, I just, I'm just really, really excited about it. I really am. I'm a little... I'm not miffed or anything. I'm just the the um, this uh, this De Deus for Dungeon thing is in Unreal Four because it had to be. Uh, Unreal Five is significantly better, but Unreal Four is, is fine and and it's supposed to look a little bit allegorical anyway. So, um, so that's uh, that's it for the animation front. But again, day by day, it becomes more and more apparent that you know uh, the, a giant um, a giant movie studio is uh, is like this room here. Yeah. You, Lawrence of Arabia. You put a couple stations in here, we're good to go. So, yeah, I guess we could use both. No reason not to use both. Um, except that it's it's awkward. And, you know, it's a shame because it, it, it would be nice if um, if the, I mean, you can, you can migrate an asset from one to another, but it's not easy. It'd be nice if there was kind of like a, you know, the standard is an FBX format. This in it, I'm just going on. You get the idea. All right, so here we go. Uh, let's go. Uh, we're going to do the billbiddle.com thing first, but I we will get to a few Facebook questions at least, at least a few, uh, even if I have to cut some of the uh, billbiddle.com questions short. Um, I am also thinking I might take, um, I might take next week off. Uh, been real stressful time uh, at the uh, at the homestead. Uh, and um, and I'm getting my voice is getting a little rough again. And furthermore, I just want to get I not only want to, I have to get this thing finished. So I might get so to do the uh, the right angles for next week and I'll just dig in and get it done. All right, here we go. Member forum at billwiddle.com. What a wonderful thing to have a forum where you can hang out with people who feel exactly the way you do and you don't have to do any new thinking at all. Uh, let's see here. 421 Stratosphere Lounge. Well, look at that. It's 421. Let's see what we got. All right. I'm going to uh, just move a couple of uh, 
windows and tabs or tabs or windows or whatever you want to call these things that's going to go over there and you're going to stay there and you're going to come up here and now we're in business all right let's see what we got now um oh conductor production says i'm going on vacation next week myself take some downtime man i i you know i, I I'm hoping, uh, by the way, before I forget, uh, Marusha asked uh, early how much, how long do I think the whole thing would be? The first chapter is probably going to be about six or seven minutes. I think the whole thing together would probably be about 25. And, um, and uh, that's the intermediate goal. So just, just to wrap this up, um, we're going to... Uh, gonna go out and do a big membership drive and fundraiser to, to get this D is for dungeon animation finished and move into the animation space and while the animation is a great selling tool it's nothing compared to the metrics nothing compared to the metrics you look at the metrics and you realize my god we are wasting our time so if we can get enough um, membership money and enough one-time donations in to finish this thing we'll get this thing done by the summer certainly well in time for the um, elections and we'll go out on back and, and go to Ben and Mike will go everywhere uh, meaning me me and Zoe if he can if he can make it we'll just go everywhere and promote the hell out of this thing as a means to um, generate enough interest to uh, get started on the colonies which is what I'd like to do next if uh, if I had my druthers and somebody had to explain that to me because I, I grew up in a foreign country all right here we go um Ron Swanson alter ego Ron Swanson one of the greatest characters of all time uh, hey, Bill. So here's a question near and dear to my heart. Full disclosure, I have multiple degrees in aerospace engineering and interned at NASA long ago, fully intent on building space stations and moon bases. Oops. Before I finish another word of this already fascinating uh, uh, question, Ron Swanson, alter ego, in, 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 that, in that one sentence, um, you encapsulated just the sheer magnitude of overall disappointment that I've experienced in my life for, with regard to uh, the things that I find interesting. I, I just, it just pisses me off that basically the, the easily, yeah, easily half of my life and probably more, two thirds of it, nothing happened, nothing, nothing happened. Um, so, uh, anyway, I'm with you, brother, because I thought we would, I thought we, I thought I'd be, I'd be there by now. All right, moving on to the rest of this question here. So I'm going to make you emperor of the world or Elon Musk, same thing for this purpose. He can be vice emperor. Elon wants to go to Mars. Where would, em what would Emperor Whittle do? Build in space, secure a comet for fuel source, moon colony, and then outward? All or something completely different. You have access to SpaceX and Blue Origin and any tech from your friendly from your friend Bert. What's your plan, O ruler of the world? I was always in favor of Earth orbit space stations as a launching point to a moon base or outward into the solar system and beyond. Those craft being built in space from minerals mined from asteroids, harvested and moved to Lagrange points. I'm sure that you have a favored plan that you've been considering and refining for 40 plus years. Enlighten us. What a what a great question. What a lovely question I needed that question just to get away from all of this stuff um, okay uh, I a lot of what I want to do was reverse engineered from what I thought I would be able to do uh, and and a lot of this is um, is what I was thought I was going to be able to do story wise so Back in 2007, I wrote uh, a screenplay called Aurora, which first draft was, I don't know, 400 pages. It should have been one, should have been 90, 95, it was insane. And I just basically wanted to start from pretty much today and, and go. So I wanted to do the science fiction movie and I decided where do I want to go? I don't want to go to Mars because every single movie is about Mars. And I got to tell you, I, I find Mars kind of boring. I mean, I really do. I'm not saying we shouldn't go, and I'm not saying I wouldn't be happy to go. I'd be very happy to, to have a, a, a trip to Mars. I'd be very happy to have a colony on Mars. But honestly, it's a pretty boring place, and nobody realizes how much like the moon it really is, because it doesn't look like the moon, but it's virtually the moon. In other words, 
there's so little atmosphere there. It's 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. The gravity's about a quarter of Earth gravity, I want to say. I think the moon is one-sixth, something like that. So basically, going to Mars is going to the moon, you know, with, with rose-colored glasses on, rust-colored glasses on. Um, and while I think it's a grand idea, if I had if I had unlimited resources, I would eventually make a Mars trip, but I'd be building I'd be building on the moon like a lunatic. On the moon. Um, so this whole Aurora story was predicated on the fact that I wanted to tell us I wanted to tell a, a science fiction story with no what was the word I used? Um, there's an old there's a, a old saw that says in science fiction you're allowed to break one law of physics or something like that. I didn't want to break any. I wanted it to be absolutely accurate. I did a lot of research on no magic. That's the word. Thank you, Dave. Uh, no magic. No warp drives. No faster than light travel. No laser beams. You know, shooting. No force fields. Nothing. Just no magic. Just go. And and that meant I had to do an awful lot of research. And I said, first question is where? Where do I go for the story point of view? Because I had a these guys had a really state-of-the-art um, uh, gas, um, uranium gas nuclear rocket, which was just spectacular. And the thing explodes and kills the entire research team. So they find out that they, they left one of the engines at Nerva out at Jackass Flats. They go to a hangar and covered in a tarp. There's, there's an engine that they didn't use. Turns out that there is, in fact, an engine that they didn't use. There's, uh, they, they built 30 or something. I don't remember exactly now. And one of them was never activated. So they just back up a truck and they pull this thing out. It's not terribly big. So they're going on this mission. They got a lot less, a lot less um, Delta V than they thought they were going to have. So they start scaling, stripping things off the ship, and they end up with this thing with the, the, the Habs are on cables, and, and they crank them in when the thing's accelerating, and then most of the trip is coasting, obviously. They reel them out and spin them around, and it was a, it was a cool design. It is a cool design. Um, and... And then I started saying, okay, so where are we going to go? And I thought, well, let's go to Jupiter. Um, and the thing that's nice about the trip to Jupiter is uh, they get to stop at, a, at an asteroid and refuel on the way. Their, their, their uh, entire idea is we're going to go to this asteroid. If we can get enough water from this asteroid, then we keep going. And if we can't, we've got enough fuel just to get home on. Um, so uh, so they go and and, and a, a fair amount of this happens at um, at at the asteroid, and I had what was the name of it? I mean, I really, really, really did the research on this. I had the uh, it's in the script somewhere. I had the asteroid picked out, all this stuff. I had the had the moons, all of it. So they're going out there, and and their wastewater. The the Habs are 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 shielded. Obviously, they're solid Habs. Um, and then on the outside of the Habs are like these plastic, big, heavy canvas, not canvas, big, heavy plastic tarps. And, and over the course of the mission, all the wastewater goes into this tarp so that by the time they get into Jupiter space, they've got a ring of, of water, probably water ice, I guess, around them. And that helps with the radiation shield. And then when they, when they take the dive, they come in underneath the belts and... And going through the belts is pretty much suicide. So I, I just started dealing with all of this stuff. I started dealing with, with I started looking at um, ways to use magnetic energy, magnetic fields to deflect some of these charged particles. That's a that's a possibility. Most of it was um, just water shielding, uh, and a fair amount of it was a fairly controversial, fairly controversial idea, but seems to show some evidence that um, if you if you dose the human body with radiation slowly your body actually gets better um, at, uh, at, at resisting radiation, at repairing the damage. Uh, and so for the closest approach anyway, these guys are inside their hab with the water around it, and then they're inside a the special room where they kind of do their sleeping thing, hibernation thing, and then, and then for the, the really tough couple of hours, they've got like lead, literally got like lead blankets on that kind of So... It was great um, and and really fun and and big action thing you know where the you know the engine 
got to go do EVA right at, right at closest approach in order to get the engine going again to get them slowed down enough. Otherwise, they're just sailing out of the solar system. So it was a, it was a fun story, and um, and it had a lot of structural problems. Uh, the the main problem being there's really no villain in it. I decided, okay, so I'm I'm not going to put a Doctor Smith on board. You're not going to just no magic, right? I mean, oh, one of the guys happens to be no. So I, I basically tried to make Jupiter the villain. I tried to make the, the planet the villain. It was, it, was, it was these guys versus Jupiter. Um, so that's my first thought is where I'd want to go. Uh, oh, it's a fairly new name. Uh, what's it? 570, 5708 Rivers? Rivera, sorry. Uh, however, where's the artificial gravity? They, they, the, the ship goes out and then it it starts to spin, and once it starts to spin, it, it lets the halves, which are attached close to the side, embraced. And once it's coasting, it starts to uh, rotate, and then they let these halves out, let the halves out, let the halves out. And that's how most of the cruise happens. And there are little synced transfer modules that, that allow you to go from one to the other, which they don't do very often. Um, I looked into things like hibernation, and I didn't want them just to get into a cool-looking plastic thing and just psh, you know, oh, where, where are we? I took it really seriously. I spent a lot of time in research on this, all the research on Jupiter, all the research on the astronomy. And then I took a fair amount of time trying to trying to find out what is proven feasible as, as far as like hibernation kind of thing. And the, the theory was that I was going to basically put them into medically induced comas. That, that can be done. You can um, attach electrodes to the muscles to stimulate them enough so that you know you don't completely atrophy that can be done you don't need to keep them out for the entire well if it was nine ten month journey or something you you put them to sleep for three weeks and you wake them up for a week and then you then somebody else wakes up for a week and you basically rotate out so you get to sleep through you know three quarters of the mission i also found out that if you if you introduce hydrogen sulfide gas to mammals and lower their temperature, their respiration, human respiration goes to four breaths a minute. Heartbeat goes down to 10, 15 beats per minute. And that's, that's proven. So basically what I was going to do is have these guys just lie in this, you know, bed kind of thing. And, and it's going to be like a chicken rotisserie because there is gravity, or centrifugal gravity in the halves. And they just eventually just kind of keep rotating them so they don't get bed sores and all the rest of this stuff. Um, so uh, it was it was it was calculated, and it still have the script obviously to a high degree. Uh, I can make that movie now, and I certainly couldn't make it in two thousand and seven, but I could make that movie right now. And uh, do I? Let's see if I've got. Pardon me while I put on my uh, viewing spectacles. I have somewhere. I have uh, some renderings of the ship. Let me see if they're handy. If they're not handy, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'll take a quick look. Uh, I think I'll put you here. Uh, Aurora, that's good. Uh -huh. Oh, what about that? I got some animations of the Habs. How? How the heck about that? Now these were done in 2007, 2008 on 3D Studio. Um, this is a view of one of the Habs here. It's going to be small, but I'm, you know, you'll get the idea. And that's those things are spinning around. I got kind of just threw them up there. Uh, that's a really bad flare, but I wanted to check the lighting on this. Lighting-wise, it's pretty cool. Uh, what else I got? Uh, come here. Uh, come here, you. What about you? You got anything to say? Oh, is that the one I just did? Uh, lighting is a little different there. It's more rimlet. That's... Uh, what are you... Just one or two more, and then I'll, I'm, I'm looking for a, a thing of the whole ship. Yeah, here's because there's a climactic scene where somebody falls off of one of these things, and 
yeah I thought it looked cool um, where are you here okay yeah cool all right so this is um this is a uh, untextured view of the Aurora flyby of the ship and the, the work on this model is just top-notch so it's got a regular docking thing on the front those big square kind of things with all our whoop, supplies I think there's a part two to that and hopefully this is all of it put together we'll see maybe not but the detail, just the mesh, that's, there's no textures on that. Just the mesh detail is fantastic. Yeah. So those are the big square things are, are cargo and supplies. There's the transfer modules. You can see the have modules are, are docked to the thing. That's just beautiful, man. The guy who did this was just so, so, so good. Uh, and then, um, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then you got that tiny little old Nerva engine on the back, but that's all you need, really. You got a lot of radiators, get rid of the waste heat and that sort of thing. Uh, see what I got here that's the same one let me see if I got something else I got one other thing here what is this is the same thing as well now all right so to hell with that we've seen those already um, and I had uh, I had somebody did some texture work on on the uh, on the ship and I didn't like the textures very much I still don't like them very much they're okay but uh, here's what the first pass of somebody else's uh, view of the textures would look like. So, yeah, kind of cool, man. Um, kind of cool. Now, uh, so, you know, the, the, that's kind of the... The thing would be really great to have. Um, it would be really great to have uh, the ability to do that stuff. I saw um, a couple. Uh, I saw on Instagram a couple of pitches for crowds crowdsource movies. Both of them were Christian movies. One of them was with Dallas Jenkins, who I knew back in the day. I haven't seen Dallas in ten years, but um, they they're raising serious money for these things. Millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars for these things. Um, and then, uh, you know, crowdfunding is um, pros and cons. You certainly think we passed peak crowdfunding, but that just means that the bogus projects have, have fallen away. Um, I think what I will what I will probably do is I need to find somebody who knows how to do these things. You know what what they need. However, with that said, I think certainly if we finish the the DS for Dungeon thing. We do some render tests. I think, um, I think, we could probably get it done. The Chosen is one of the shows. Uh, Eric Blake mentioned that. Um, and Lady Hawk says help fund the funding for Gosnell. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. I spent a couple, couple of hours with, um, with uh, international film and television star Nick Cersei just a week or two ago. Um, so. Uh, can we get it crowdfunded? We don't need tons of money by the by the scale of Hollywood. You know, we need a million, two million dollars, maybe something like that. I think if I was to do Aurora, I would do it live action with. So, and the reason I did it was I designed it this way. The only set is the is the Hab thing. There's a couple of little sets, but it's not it's not terribly big, and they're all tiny, which is nice. Um, so I would do that one live action, I suspect. And then I would also um, do, uh, you know, 3D scans of the actor's faces. So anything that's a medium shot, anything outside the ship, any of the zero G stuff at the core, all of that would be CG. But, it, you know, there's a lot, a lot of talking. And you could make the same argument for colonies, too. Although by the time we get this thing ready to go, you saw what you just saw. If you, if you can't tell the difference, then, you know, there you go. There's a, it's a lot tougher than it looks. This motion capture and facial capture. It, you, you can get you can get eighty or ninety percent of the way there relatively easily, but that final ten percent is work. Anyway, um, uh, that's uh, that's it. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Eric. I I, I have 
I have considered this, and I've talked to him about the, the colonies and stuff, uh, kind of informally. So, um, so yeah. So now, just to answer the, the last part of your question here, um, Ron, if I can call you Ron, uh, many years after I did Aurora, I want to say about 2013-14, somewhere around there. Um, we were thinking about this idea of doing a you know, crowdfunded space program. This is before Elon Musk came along and showed us that progress was actually capable. And I had an idea. So this is my lowball uh, version of what I would do if I had the money, you know, basically could write the checks I wanted to. I would do a flyby of Venus. Nobody talks about Venus. It's like Venus doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because it's spectacularly whoop am I not getting any audio why am I not seeing any audio oh okay we are because <laughs> I put up I put up enough uh, different video sources there that my audio scrolled way down and I thought well, the guys would have been screaming about it uh, but but if you think about the energy and the distance it's much much easier to go to Venus than it is to go to Mars much easier it's closer um, it's, uh, it's downhill, uh, wouldn't orbit. I would just do a flyby and come back. You can, you can cut back on a lot of your, uh, your, you know, consumables and stuff. Well, why go to Venus? I said, well, because you'd be the first person to visit another planet. That's why you'd, you'd fly to another planet. That would be pretty cool. Wouldn't try to land there. There's no reason to land there. If I was going to land someplace, I'd land somewhere else. Now, Burger 10 has the best idea ever. Um, he said his his dream mission, and once he told me this, I thought, yeah, it's kind of my dream mission too, and I think that, um, that Elon's actually planning this. So, the space station's traveling, International Space Station's traveling at roughly 18,000 miles an hour, 130 miles above the Earth, right? So, you look like do I think about going to Europa? Europa would be where I would go. If I could go anywhere, I'd go to Jupiter and I'd go to Europa. That's where the water is, and I'd go to Ceres on the way just to just to get a, you know, all my bottles filled up. So when you see the Earth uh, from the space station, it's it's a it's a nice you know uh, majestic kind of a of a scroll and ninety minutes round numbers to orbit the Earth, and and you can tell you're moving real fast because you're seeing big planet rolling by underneath you, but you don't get the illusion of speed from Earth orbit. You never, I've never seen anything in Earth orbit, never heard anybody in Earth orbit describe the sense of it being fast. It's majestic and it's impressive and all the rest of it, but it, it doesn't feel fast. That's got to do with the distance away from the thing that you're going around. But Bert said, now, what if you were to do a mission we have extremely extremely accurate information on the um, on the on the varying gravitational regions on the moon we obviously have an excellent idea of the moon's gravity but we also know where the gravitational anomalies are we know what parts of the moon are a little tiny bit gravitationally stronger or weaker than others and with that knowledge he said you could do a mission where the mission is an ellipt elliptical orbit and then and then the um, periapsis, the closest approach, technically could be 200 feet, right? I mean, you could, you could, with a high degree of precision, get down so low, you'd be in a, you'd be in a real steep approach, so you would, you would get that, but for, for, you know, for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, things would be rushing past, and for, and for that, that minute or two around closest approach, you'd be doing Five, six thousand, seven thousand miles an hour over the surface of a planet, at, you know, at, at 500 feet or something. It'd be like nobody's ever experienced that ever. That would be magnificent. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact, just for Bert, I'm going to go ahead and and uh, and render that out. There's a <laughs> most of the textures in in Unreal or uh, in 3D Studio or are, are either 4K or 8K textures, either 4,000 pixels or 8,000 pixels. There is an asset out there that is a that is a model of the moon that I want to say is 80k. So you're really, really, really able to get close to it because of the because the, the the maps are huge, and so you could get really, really close. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, Bart's treasure says no sonic booms, nothing. No sonic booms, no no buffeting, no turbulence, nothing. Just moon getting bigger, 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 bigger. Here comes the limb. Oh my God! Oh my God! We're definitely going to hit. We have. There's no way we're not going to hit. And then whoosh, turn around and just watch it go. That would be a pretty cool mission. Hey, Wazard's back after a month. Good to see you, Wazard. Um, uh, an Aldrin Cycler. George, George says an Aldrin Cycler is a cool concept. Semi-permanent space vehicle on an eccentric orbit that crosses Earth and Mars orbits. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing you have to be thinking about if you're serious about it. you got to be thinking about this thing long term. And I remember, and this was just months, not years ago, months ago, when they were talking about Mechazilla and, and the ability to grab a, 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 a Starship booster, refuel it, move it over here from where they caught it to where they launch it, stick another Starship top stage on it and fire it. And Musk was saying an hour turnaround. I said, an hour turnaround? Come on, dude. I mean, you're very impressive, but just don't, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. He was apparently serious because he did the math, and I can't remember. I, I originally thought it was 50,000, but I think he said to go to Mars and, and stay there is 10,000 Starship launches. 10,000! If you had told me it was 100, I would have thought, God, it's got to be way less than that. Way less. I would have thought probably 30, maybe 30 would have done it. But no, it's like 10,000. And so he's gearing up for, for, for 10,000. Um so anyway, uh, yeah, and Marisha says, those who say it can't be done shouldn't get in the way of those doing it. Exactly. And Jeff Bezos, uh, you are a bad, bad man. Bad man. Sue your way into slowing Elon Musk down just because he's doing what you had much more time and money to do and didn't do because you weren't taking it seriously. Go to hell, Jeff. Okay, uh, so here we go. That, hopefully that covered that one, uh, Ron. Let's see what we got in terms of total number here. We have a, we don't seem to have a part two. All right, so it seems like it's a cheap. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Okay, um, from Ian Nolan. Uh, uh, Bill, one more post about the Great Reset, inflation, fiat currency, etc. Sorry to harp on this. Harp away. We need it. I think it's a missing puzzle piece of, to a lot of what's going on currently. Everything happening within the economy is exactly in line with the modern monetary theory principles said they were going to do. Assuming that this is one of the main tools of the Great Reset, colon, it is their core tenet that the debt can go to infinity. Only the interest payment on the debt is important. I managed to figure that out on my own a couple years ago, and I was very proud of myself for that. I'm sure it's self-obvious to people in the finance business, but when I realized this debt was never going to get paid back ever, I thought, well, wh why is this thing going on? And then I realized, well, as long as the payments are being made, I suppose, you know. Anyway, uh, so yes, uh, second point, the inflation is deliberate like the gas prices to achieve societal change, and they will do so very selectively by choosing which interests to feed with quantitative easing, treasury manipulation and such, and it helps with the debt payments, of course. Yes, my first take on that, um, Ian, would be that uh, if you have rampant inflation, the people who feel it the most are the responsible middle class people who've saved their money, right? Those are the people who feel it. If you're on government assistance, you don't much care about inflation. You just, they're just gonna inflate your payments and just put it on the tab, right? But, um, but if you've saved your money and you want to, and you want to, when I say destroy a class, I don't mean line them up against the wall. I don't put that past anybody. Um, if you want to eliminate the middle class, one good way to do it is to have inflation high enough to, to wipe out your savings, you know? So, so you've saved $500,000 for your retirement. Okay, rent on your apartment now is $10,000 a month. You know, so that's a, a, a point as well. Now, watching what happened, we had a chart, I think I think might've been Ian that brought it, but it was a chart we did last week uh, that shows how after we went off the gold standard of 71, I guess it was Nixon for sure, um, you just saw this divergence of these different things, and the top of them was like corporate earnings, the bottom one was wages, and uh, and previous to this, they'd track it's essentially right on top of each other. Um, so yeah, you know, if money's not worth anything, then then we're we're walking around in the dark. Um, next point: big spending is fun, but it's the financial manipulation that is the real reset. I agree. 
They've hedged and leveraged all of their interests to profit from the inflation at the expense of the rest of society. It's an evil game, and I hate it, but I am playing it well also. Good for you. I mean it. If, if this thing is being manipulated and you know how to protect yourself by it, then you're not doing it, Ian. You're not the guy responsible for it. If you can see the pattern, uh, by all means, go for it. I wish I could. Um, it's probably not that ownership will be banned. It's just that they'll own 95% of the prop property via BlackRock, et cetera, and the efforts and money to own one's own home will be increasingly difficult with renting increasingly easy. Yes, nobody will own everything, anything, and everybody will be happy. Precisely correct. Precisely correct. We'll make it so that if you want to buy a house, your, your mortgage is $5,000 a month, but if you want to rent that exact same house, which is owned by BlackRock or somebody else, then it's only $2,000 a month or whatever. So yes, and pretty soon nobody owns anything except for these guys who are now getting all these rent payments. So that means their, their financial capabilities go up, which means they buy more properties and so on and so on and so on. And if you're going to criticize this idea, and I am strongly critical of it, you, I, with any idea, you got to start by saying, okay, so what's wrong with this idea? And if your standard of living stayed the same and you could just keep getting all this free stuff because they're printing money, okay, what's the downside of that? The downside is when Schwab says that uh, nobody will own anything and everybody will be happy, what he means is none of you will own anything and everybody will be happy. And the, the great unwashed may be perfectly happy, but the difference is if they own it, they can turn it off, right? That's, that's it. Um, and, and yes, what, what's concerning me now um, is that uh, is that there's some some pretty good evidence that these that these guys are now taking the money that they've made using financial instruments like um, collateralized debt obligations and all the rest of the stuff that crashed the economy in 2008. So they've speculated, made all this money on financial instruments, and now they're starting to use that cash. That they that they earn that electronic cash to buy real world things. That's why America's farmer is Bill Gates. Bill Gates apparently owns more agricultural farmland than anybody else in the country. There's nothing inherently wrong with with farmland being owned by Bill Gates, except for the fact that it is so far off of his what you would assume would have been his uh, his wheelhouse. That you got to start asking yourself some questions. Um, so, uh, all right. And then, um, final one is they probably don't want hyperinflation, which would be a run, which would be runaway. It's a controlled process. Yes. Problem with hyperinflation is that if you have hyperinflation, now you've got desperate people. And this is the thing that I've been, that I've been watching. I've been watching them watching us. The, I think one of the main takeaways from the COVID pandemic to the degree that it was a pandemic and to the degree that, you know, all of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into all of that on this firewall series, all of it. Um, but I think one of the things that, that it accomplished for these people is it, it, it gave them real world data and they live and live and die on data. It gave them mountains and mountains and mountains of data about how much people will take and about which people will take what and who won't take any and which countries are more susceptible to this kind of thing and which ones aren't. And I would have thought America, if you told me this, in fact, I talked to my wife when this, I talked to Natasha when the thing started, when the lockdown started. And they said, you know, mass social distance. And I said, hey, well, masks may be for two weeks to flatten the curve. We're not going to wear masks forever. Americans would never put up with it. Well, turns out that a lot of Americans would put up with it, and it turns out that a lot of Americans still are out there. I got an email from someone who was on a, kind of a, wish it had been me, honestly, was on a commercial jet and and sat down next to um, a person, and the person did what Kara and I flew with last time, said, could you adjust your mask, please, over your nose? Okay, it's federal reg regulation, so he puts his mask over his nose. And the flight continues. And here's the part that's just too good to be true. Two thirds or something of the way through the flight, the captain gets on the um, gets on the intercom and says, 
ladies and gentlemen, we have just heard from the airline that the uh, that the mask mandate has been struck down. You are now free to remove your masks if you want to. And he said, lots of applauding throughout the plane and lots of people not applauding. And he said, probably his best guess was 35% of the people, 30 to 40% of the people on the plane did not take their masks off, did not take it off. Uh, I routinely get in elevators. It happened to me twice, three times today. Got in an elevator, somebody wearing a mask. And then I looked outside and I saw somebody coming into the building wearing a mask. They were walking down the sidewalk wearing a mask. And, um, and now it's getting to be like a, it's getting to be like a, like trace or die, you know, it's, it's getting to be like a psychological, uh, marker. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, we get a lot more of these here in California, although I'm sure there, there, there are some in every state. But here in California, I still see, routinely see, people in their car. Now, I mean today, people in their cars driving alone with the windows up wearing a mask. Now, that is evidence of a, of a complete neurotic and, and a person who is 100%, 100%, um, owned by uh, peer pressure. This is what the good citizens do, and I'm going to wear a mask inside. Not not because it's going to. What are you going to infect your, yourself? If you're wearing a mask inside a car with the windows up by yourself, you are doing it to show the people outside the car something. You're doing it to show them something, right? So, okay. I look at these people now, and 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 I'm not at the point where I can laugh at them yet, but I'm at the point now where I'm like, you know, um, okay. Uh, let me, um, and there's a link here that Wazard's putting up and it's highly recommended. And if I don't click it, I'll never will. So I'll just leave that up there and I'll come back to it. Uh, oh, well, it's by Dennis Craver. Dennis Craver, he says, now I understand, I better understand the good German. Now, I want to get this clear. Uh, I have not read this article. Yep, I have not read it. But I did do, uh, I remember if it was a moving back to America or far away, I did, I did do something about this idea of anticipatory compliance that that astonishingly when the word went out in like some of these ghettos to increase restrictions on like on Jews in the Jewish ghetto let's say the first time they were asked to wear armbands or something significant number majority of the people that were being subjected to this new repression lined up to be first in line to wear the armbands why well, it's, it's very similar to Stockholm Syndrome. They had been so brutalized and terrorized for so long that what they, that what they wanted to do was they wanted to show that they were the good ones, right? You, you don't have to kill us, right? Because you tell us to wear the armbands? Okay, see Kyle, that's what we'll do. Um, and, and of course, this is how you get tyranny in the first place, is by everybody just kind of shutting up. But anticipatory compliance and this is this this Kathy Griffin is just sometimes it's like you know I don't want to sound blasphemous or anything but sometimes I just want to say God you know you don't have to turn it up to 11 I get that some people are stupid you don't have to go quite that far I think it's a little too on the nose now so Kathy Griffin a couple weeks ago uh it was a tweet or something or uh, Instagram or something and she's coming out and she's got a she's got a bandage on her arm and she said fourth booster shot bitches something like that you know look at me look how look how um obedient i am and how docile i am and look at how well i follow instructions i not only follow instructions well i'm enthusiastic about being told what to do what a complete what a complete failure of a of a person just a failure. Is she still relevant, Lady Oxa? No, she's not relevant. She was never relevant. I will give her credit for one thing only, and that was, I think, her. he had a book called uh, Life on the D-List. Any kind of self-deprecating humor, I, I automatically, you get a brownie point for. So, um, but uh, Marisha Dark says, I think we should just point and laugh at these people. I'm at the point now where I'm looking at them like they're, like they're nuts. And, um, and that's because, you know, they're nuts. And by the way, uh, since this was part of the question and the Great Reset and everything, 
I have to tell you, uh, pretty much all of you know by now that Natasha and I got COVID over the holidays, December 21st, I want to say. And it was the sickest I've ever been in my life by a wide margin. And I was down for two weeks and lost 16 pounds. And it was not fun at all. I had 102 fever for eight days and 104 fever for probably three or four of those. It was not a good time. I didn't eat. I couldn't drink. My throat was, it was miserable. It was a miserable time. But, okay. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, yes, I got very sick. I got sicker than my wife because I'm seven years older than my wife. And my nephew, who's 13, was sick for 12 hours. And the next thing you know, he's running around with his 12-year-old immune system, just as happy and healthy as can be. I just wanted to strangle him and gave serious thought while he was sleeping to, you know, a little chloroform or something, drink some of that blood, get some of those 12-year-old antibodies in my system. But, but seriously, this is, this is an important thing that needs to be said, right? I got as sick as I've ever been in my life, and I didn't enjoy it, but it wasn't the end of the world, you know? I, it, it wasn't like, it, I was never at death's door. Now, I'm not saying that nobody's at death's door, but what I am saying is, it's like when I look at these people doing these things, it's like, it's really like, we, we, we got hit with aerosolized Ebola, something with an 85% mortality rate, you know, where you start bleeding out of the eyes and the next thing you know, you just turn into a puddle of jelly. That's how these people are acting about this stuff. And my point is now, especially having been through it, it's like, okay, so you know what? Everybody's going to get it. I, to I told you this in, not that I'm a scientist or anything, I'm not a biologist. I mean, you know, God knows. But what I heard it was highly contagious aerosolized flu type virus. It said, everybody in the world is going to get this. Why not just get it over with? Why not just get it over with? Right. And so we got it late. We're 18 months, 19, 20 months into the thing before Natasha and I got it. So we got it. Okay. And was sick. Were you sick? Yes, I was sick. I was really sick. So, so we should mask. No, no, I mean, it's not worth destroying my life over. People get sick, you know, people get sick. And, and this is something to get hysterical over. It's because of the it's because of the pandemic porn. It's because of the the death counts and the and the numbers and and all the fear you know and all these people they just had like you know what are the numbers? That's my first question back in April of 2020. What are the actual numbers? How many people are dying? How many people are infected? And of the ones who are seriously sick or dying. What are their conditions? Now, if it turned out that, uh, you know, people in their early 60s were, were kicking off at a rate of 50%, I'd have an entirely different view about this stuff, but they weren't, so I don't. And it is, a, it, pe some people in the comment section, Steve Eisen said, it's a religion, and it is a religion. It's, it's the religion of progressivism. Uh, Aesop sent a link here, um, and, it's, and I'd, I'd already seen it. <laughs> you know... This is what happens when there's no media. There's a video out there now. I'm, I, I'm sure it was relatively recently discovered, but it is Dr. Fauci 30 years ago, darker hair, something like that. And he's being asked about the flu. It might have been swine flu or something. And Fauci is saying, well, you know what? Well, well the, the, the vaccine, this is 30 years ago. The vaccine is showing some effect on someone. Said, now, of course, if you've already gotten the flu and recovered, then that's natural immunity, and, and that's as good as it gets. It's the gold standard. We, our vaccines, the best vaccines only approach that. If, you, if you've caught this thing and, and survived it, you've got nothing to worry about. Along these lines, uh, Natasha had a friend who had two friends who got COVID. And then she said, I'm a little worried. And this is back in December. And then two or three days later, I'm starting to feel a little chilled. A week ago, she had another friend um, uh, who, who also came down with um, COVID. And she said, she, you know, we should probably go get tested. I said, why? Why? We're immune. It's a lovely word, you know? And if there were no vaccines at all, and, 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 and somebody had said, yeah, this is the cost. This is what this thing is going to do, right? It's going to make people sick and the older you are the sicker you get 
and you will be down for two weeks. Uh, people younger than you might be down for 10 days. Significantly younger people will be down for a week, and, and, and anybody under 30 will be sick for hours. And therefore, we're going to destroy everything and shut down society. This is the thing of all. This is like the election thing, right? It's like, well, what evidence do you have of election tampering? Well, my first evidence is, is that they stopped counting. Five states stopped counting. That's never happened before. There's no excuse for it. Nobody ever explained it. it was never explained. There's your evidence. That's the evidence. You can talk about, well, show me a ballot. Why did they stop counting? Nobody's ever answered that. The same thing here. Why all of this insanity? Given the numbers, given the numbers. I remember after I recovered, and uh, my energy is much better now, but not only was I down for two weeks, but for at least a month or two after that, I was tired a lot. I'll get to that in a second there, Steve. Um, but, you know, okay, I'm better. And And by the way, I don't have a, you know, I didn't, I didn't come into this world with a receipt, you know, that says that, uh, I'm sorry, no, this is my, this is my written guarantee that I do not get sick this time around, that this life is, I, I, I never get sick, I will not be suffering from accidents, never get any diseases, nothing, no. I expect to go through life 100% smoothly, don't expect to have a sick day ever, and I expect I'm going to die in my sleep at 106 uh, in, a, in, a, in a room, in a hospital, surrounded by loved ones and candles, and that's, that's, I've got my receipt right here, this is what I'm guaranteed. You know, B Fire says I had a rough time with it, mostly due to secondary problems. I have zero regrets about being unvaxxed. Only outside treatment I needed was some IV fluids. I got the IV fluids, and the next day I was much better. When I say fluids, I just mean saline solution, because I was so so dehydrated. Um, but yeah, and we're not gonna we're not gonna get into not here. We will we will absolutely get into therapies that uh, that have nothing to do with Victrolas and, and what their success rate was and which were not available to me in the state of California because uh, they were made illegal by, by people in Sacramento who were trying to kill me. So there you go. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, that's that. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, here we go. Virtual President Bill. It's been a while. A nice ring to it. I have a question and a follow-up. Uh, I'm sorry, this is from Road Rider. Road Rider. Uh, how many years ago was it when the three of you sat down in the same room? You, Scott, and Steve Green. I'm virtually positive it was at a PJ TV party, which would have made it 2011, maybe 2012. Ten years. It's been ten years. Um, I know. I know the very old old saying: familiarity breeds contempt. Might come into play here. But when could you three get together in person? Cameras or none, recording or not, you have to like each other or at least tolerate each other to be doing this remotely for so long. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, it was after CPAC. Uh, no, I, I hate them both. Um, uh, obviously, no. Um, you know, it, it, it's strange. It's an interesting question. And, and the reason it's so interesting is because um, while I've done an awful lot of complaining about the virtual world, this experience that we're having now and stuff, it is still, it, does, it never ceases to amaze me. It's just miraculous. Um, by the way, Natasha's been doing uh, some videos of her painting and, and, and techniques and, and some observations on life in America, and she's very self-conscious about it. And most people are when, you know, if you, I've just been speaking in public. I've been public speaking since I started at the Planetarium when I was 14, I guess, and, and I've been on camera for a while, too. So I started making movies when I was 16. I was in those. So I've been, I'm, I'm used to it. But it's, it's pretty, it's pretty intimidating if you're not used to it. And, and, this was a discussion we had a week ago, less than a week. It was last Friday. I came home from doing the last stratosphere lounge, and we were talking about it. She said, you always come home, you're just so, so much more cheerful and upbeat after stratosphere lounge. I said, what, after that grind? But no, but she's right. It's just really cheers me up. And then I had a thought that I have never had a thought, that I've never thought about before in my life. I've done 
200 and uh, 300? How many of these things have I done? This is worth an answer to that question because I can get that question answered pretty fast. I have done... Uh, yeah, uh, this will be 323. There might be another extra show or two in there, but this is 323 episodes, so obviously well in advance of 300 episodes that I've done of the Stratosphere Lounge, right? And and so I've sat here for 327 uh, times and and talked with you. And that's exactly how it feels. It feels like I have a conversation with the people who are in the live stream. And that's another good reason to get on the live stream because I don't feel anything like that when I'm doing anything else. This is this show is, goes out live, right? And I've done a lot of public speaking events as well. So the thought that I had last Friday, you could have knocked me down with a feather, was that when the, when the, um, when the cleaning people come and open the door, they see a guy sitting in a room by himself, talking to air like I am right now. I'm alone in a room here, just talking for three hours. And, and I never, ever, ever thought of it that way once. Not once did I think of it that way, ever. It's always been well. It's I open this little window and I talk to you guys. And and so the idea that 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 just you know just somebody peeks in the window or something, it's just a guy in here just talking to himself. I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking to you. And um and it's a it's a it's a miraculous thing, it's a wonderful thing, it really is. But that really was quite a surprise to me. Um uh, something very similar to that was uh when I did the uh, afterburners at PJ TV. Um, PJ TV had a pretty high tech situation when it was put in in 2008. They had a they had a a three wall psych cyclorama with the curved floors. So there's no shadows. All painted chroma key green, and then they had a virtual set that responded to the camera motions. So the afterburner set was designed. And here's the thing that, that, that blows my mind. I did, I don't know, a hundred, I would say, at least. Yeah, at least. I did one a week and I was there for years. Probably a couple hundred, anyway. So every time I would shoot a, an afterburner, I'd get on the set, guys are in the control room over there, and I'm looking at monitors and the monitors are showing me keyed into the background in real time. I walked in once and they were replaying some footage and it was me doing the afterburner in front of a green screen, which is how it was recorded. Well, it was actually recorded with the, with the background in. So not only did I not see the green screen when I was looking at it as I was shooting it, when I edited it, because I edited all of those, I, I never keyed in the green. It's on the firewalls are shot against the green screen, but, but those things weren't. And when I first saw the, myself against this green, I thought, what the hell is that? It's like, well, that's how you do the things, man. You've been standing in front of a green cube for five years now. Strange, isn't it, when you get fooled by your own post-production. All right, let's see here. Uh, back to the question, because, uh, you know, I hate to get off the... really hate it if I got off uh, off point or off topic here. That would, that would be a first. I've done 323 stress-free lounges, and I've stayed on target for zero of them. Okay, so b back to this. Um, point two, aside from the show and website mechanics, how does Scott and Steve and Zoe help you professionally and personally? Because it seems very genuine when you tell Zoe during the virtue signal that he's helped you or given you a new perspective, how do you help them? Serious question. Yes. There have been many times when, um, when Zoe would just cheer me up because Zoe's got this bedrock faith that, it, that I don't have. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't believe in these things, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not, I don't go there the way he does. It grounds him, and all, all the people I know who are devout Christians are grounded that way, and I've always admired it. Um, so, he's certainly helped me, and, and Steve and Scott cheer me up and make me laugh. Uh, but I'll just answer this question as as bluntly as I possibly can here. We all like each other. We're all four of us are friends, and we all respect each other and all the rest of that's authentic and real. 
but the actual answer to your question is how do they help me professionally and personally they give me five shows a week and that is the bread and butter of this organization without right angle we'd be done uh, as i'm sure virtually all of you know we record five shows on a tuesday uh, we do a backstage show for members only which I always joke about because it's just us. It's it's not even a it's not even a show. It's a show about what are we going to do when we get to the shows. But a lot of members really like it because we. It's an hour long. An hour long. <laughs> it's just it's anesthesia is what it is. It's just it's just anesthesia. But it's an hour long, and since it's members only completely, we get to be a lot looser, and we just plain you know goof, and we'll talk about you know Rolling Stones and talk about everything. So we do that show first on Tuesday, and that usually takes about an hour. And then um, prior to that show, although sometimes three minutes prior to that show and sometimes 10 minutes into the show, but usually prior to the show, each one of the three of us has a topic. We bring a, we bring a show topic each, and we host that show. And we used to do a members-only show until the members, this is a credible thing about our members, the members said, these members only shows are really you know, pretty good. They're as good as the rest of them. We don't want them kept under the firewall. Just, you know, put them out there with the rest of them. So here's your members benefit. Yeah, yeah, just, just reinvest it, essentially. Astonishing. So we didn't want to cut a show. So we did, we had historically done the backstage show. Bill has a show. Scott has a show. Steve has a show. And then a member show. Um, and so we've kept that format. We released the member show. And uh, that's how we number the shows. So any given week this this last set of trifectas were uh, 0 4 19 22 uh, w m o g for whittle ott members green and then bs for backstage which is probably the most appropriate you know uh, what's the word i'm looking for uh certainly the most appropriate initials in the history of, of show business or entertainment but that takes three hours maybe of my day, three hours of my day during a week. We hand it off to Mark, who's done an amazing job of editing, who's edited all of our shows for years now. I've met him once. Um, I don't like him much either. I don't like any of them, really, to be perfectly honest with you. But that's why we never get together in person. But to answer your question seriously, what they give me is they give me content, and I don't have to do five shows a week by myself. Uh, they bring shows. I don't have to talk during all of them either. So there's that. Um, and then what I do for them is I pay them. And what that really means is you pay them. We don't keep a lot of the money that comes in. And, I mean, this place is really is the money comes in and the money goes out. That's pretty much it. Um, and, and so we pay them. You know, we don't pay them a lot, but we don't pay them badly either. And... And it's, it's good for everybody. It, they, they like the exposure. Uh, and, and we just have fun doing it. And with regards to your question about the last time we were all four together, or the last time the three of us were together in the same room, if you'd asked me the question honestly, I'd say, well, I think the last time the three of us were together in the same room was, uh, was Tuesday, two days ago. Because that's how real and how, and how accustomed we are now to thir 12, 13 years of this now, of... of seeing each other every Tuesday morning it's just like a it's like a meeting it's a Tuesday morning meeting and so I feel like last time I saw Scott and Steve in person was two days ago but the last time I really saw him in person was 10 years ago there's um that's that's a m miraculous thing so um so it's it, you know it's working out great for everybody now if we can get this animation up and running I'll get to achieve my two lifelong goals which is number one to be in the filmmaking business and number two to fire all of these losers those are the two things that, that keep me going when uh when i you know when i wake up in the morning and try and get myself all frisky um yeah people are using the k word in the comments just for the just for those of you that don't know uh, i did a show with andrew clavin at pjtv called clavin whittle i decided to put his name first because alphabetically uh and uh and i carried him for you know 500 shows um, but when PJTV broke up and, and, and Drew went to Daily Wire and we went off on our own here, 
we uh, started um, we started uh, I started really uh, this this uh, phony feud and and let me tell you something phony feuds are a blast I was inspired by um, by um, Jack Benny and Fred Allen how how do I know about Jack Benny and Fred Allen? You might ask. I'm not old enough to have listened to those radio shows. I'm considerably younger than that. I'm 30 years younger than uh, being old enough to have grown up on on Jack Benny or Allen's Alley, the Fred Allen show. The reason I know about Jack Benny and Fred Allen is because of Jack Horkheimer, because Jack Horkheimer wrote a show called Buck Rogers Right On, which was about Mars, about Mariner Nine mission. So he basically kind of mixed up Buck Rogers, what Buck Rogers knew about Mars back in the 30s versus what we know about Mars today. Well, today being 1970, what is it, Phil, 2, 72, 72, 70, 72, 70, somewhere in there. Um, and so because Jack did that, he did the whole show as kind of a Buck Rogers serial with the, the, the right music, but the walk-in, I, half of the stuff I swear I know in terms of what well, more than half of what I know musically I know because of the stuff that Jack Horkheimer decided was going to go into the walk-in music and for those of you unfamiliar with the term we had a big old planetarium and we would open the doors and we'd put 300 and 360 340 people 340 45 people something like that. So 300 people in there, and it takes a while for them to come in, and, and it's not usually full. So we open the doors at 10 minutes till, or showtime, or quarter till, or whatever. And so we got 15 minutes of people sitting in the dome. We didn't want them sitting in there in silence. So sometimes we just had generic, you know, moody blues music. But when Horkheimer did a show, one of the things he did was he would make sure that the walk-in music set the stage for the show. He was a brilliant guy. He was a genius. He really was. He was a brilliant guy. He gave me so many opportunities. And without a doubt, one of the most annoying people ever to walk the earth. He really just drove. He, he was like, Horkheimer was like, <laughs> you remember, um, do you, if you're old enough, you remember those magnetic faces? It was a it was like a cartoon face with a plastic cover and had, and had um, iron filings in it. And you had a magnet. And you put the magnet underneath and you could drag the iron filings out so you could make like mustaches and, and beards and, and stuff like that, right? That's the kind of things we used to play with. This came just after we gave up the hoops and the sticks. Um, but they were fun. And and I don't know why. If Petula is walk-in music. Absolutely right, Astronaut. Precisely right. Petula Clark, which if you're watching this on YouTube, you've never heard it. Every single show opens with Petula Clark's I Know a Place. And everybody in the comment section, the second that soon, because I've got a bunch of really, I need to, up, I need to completely update the, the walk-in music here. But uh, before we start the show, virtually every time, it's 15 minutes of, of theme shows. Theme music from, from Lost in Space, Johnny Quest, uh, you know, The Munsters, Dark Shadows, UFO. So... This is all walking music. Anyway, the, the magnetic thing. I was trying to think about the effect that Jack Horkheimer had, and I realized this, this thought just flew into my head. There's two people in the world going to find this funny. I'm one, and Phil Trick is the other. Uh, Jack Horkheimer was like the magnet underneath those things. Wooly Willy. Thank you, George. Jack Horkheimer was like the magnet that, addre that it attracted neuroses and, 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 and um, anxiety and... and and anger, and it just, he was like, he just pulled these things in. Uh, I don't want to, uh, so I'm not speaking ill of him, I'm telling the truth about the guy. He was a genius, he, he, I wouldn't be here without him. I, I loved the man, I really did, but I also hated his guts, because he was tough to deal with, he was tough to be around. He'd deliver a script two days before the press conference, which he's announced three months ago. And we were walk we were sleeping on the floor. Me and Phil and Doug and Bill DeShong and uh, I remember Ed Kashuba for a while there from Bradenton Planetarium. We were just sleeping on the floor. We were there for two, three days, around the clock. Um anyway, uh the reason I know about 
and it goes back to Clavin and the and the um, and the feud. For half for for twenty minutes before every show for Buck Rogers right on, he had highlights from the Golden Age of Radio, um, and and the thing he ran the longest was a segment from Alan's Alley, and Alan's Alley was uh, was a, was a regular part of of Fred Allen's radio show, and it was all done live. And basically, the conceit is radio, so you can't tell. But the conceit is he's walking down a street and he's talking to the neighbors. He next door, the next door, the next door, and so on. So there was this old Jewish lady named Mrs. Nussbaum, and there was uh, I think there was kind of like an old kind of a kind of a you know kind of an old kind of a Western kind of guy. But the one that that, that you never forget uh, ever was um, was Senator Claghorn. He had a they had actually made a movie, a uh, feature film, featuring Senator Claghorn. But Senator Claghorn was a character, I've, I should know the actor's name, I don't, it'll appear here by magic in a few moments. Um, but Senator Claghorn was the guy that, that, that the Looney Tunes character of Foghorn Leghorn was based on. He was an old Southern Democrat senator. Uh, Senator Cla- boy, I say boy, and, and, and it was just brilliant. And the one, the one clip that he played that I listened to 200, who am I kidding, probably a thousand times or more. Fred Allen is going up and he's talking to Senator Claghorn and, uh, and, and Claghorn is going on and on and on. And, and this was the, he played this because it was the funniest moment in Fred Allen's show history. And, and Fred's talking to Claghorn, and, and Claghorn's going on and on and on. And finally, he talks, and, and you can you can tell that this is ad lib. And and then and so Fred just gives a little gap in the conversation. So Fred Allen goes, "I win it, eh?" And instantly, thank you, Kenny Delmar. Instantly, he says, "Just sucking in a little air, son." And then and then Fred Allen says, "Well, leave a little. I'm breathing too, you know." And and that's great. And then um. And then right after that, Claghorn is saying, uh, uh, you know, I, I delivered a speech and I'd had since six mint juleps. And, uh, and Fred Allen says, you had six mint juleps and you still held the floor? And Claghorn says, held the floor? Son, I couldn't get up off of it. Ha, 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 ha. Brilliant. I think my favorite moment ever in television was when was when Foster Brooks was roasting somebody and he turned to Dean Martin and he said something to the effect of, um, last time we were together, we were lying on a floor and somebody stepped on my tongue. Foster Brooks, the greatest, greatest comedian ever lived. <sighs> okay, so anyway, so the, the Clayton thing is a fake feud that we have, and it's just really, really fun. Um, yeah, those roasts, uh, John Pershing says those roasts were great. They were great. They tried to, they, they still do them apparently at Comedy Central, occasionally, and they're, they're appalling. They're people issuing vicious, vicious, vicious slurs at each other, and they don't know each other. They're not friends. The reason that the roasts work was because these people were friends. They worked together all the time, and they were all stars, major stars. You could make fun of them because people knew, number one, that the person making fun of them was a friend of this guy, and number two, the guy was a legend. So Foster Brooks is, is doing the roast of um, Sammy Davis Jr., and he's talking about... Um, he closed it by saying, "Anyway, we're happy to hear to have you honored." And, and it's a long way from the old days when, 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 when Frank Sinatra would get on the phone and, and call the front desk and say, "Send the and, and send the send the colored guy up to dance, some to sing something like that." And and Sammy Davis Jr. just just cracks up laughing because they were brilliant, brilliant. If you really want to see Foster Brooks, the one to watch is the Foster Brooks of Don Rickles. Uh, because Foster Brooks always had like a theme. He would always, he'd come out as kind of a different character. And not a different character, a different angle. So on one of them, he was, uh, he was a, the Cub Scout, the Boy Scout leader of this guy and so on. The one with Don Rickles is, is my favorite by far. And 
and he gets up there and he's on the podium and he's looking down at Don Rickles and he says, uh, I don't know, Mr. Rickles, we've never worked together and our paths have never crossed. However, Don, the two of us do have one thing in common. I'm messing around with your wife. And then, and Rickles just starts crying, crying, laughing. And then, and then Foster Brooks goes on about how they, how, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm not going to spoil it for it. Just, just Foster Brooks roast of Don Rickles. He's brilliant. And he was not drunk. He, he didn't drink. He just, uh, it made my mom cry. He, she laughed so hard when, when, when they saw him. He's just so good. He's so good. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, Henry Lumley. Hey, what about that? Thank you again, Henry, for all the work you do in this uh, in the forum and on, on the Stretch for Lunch questions especially. Hey, Bill, what's your take on the DeSantis strikes back against the Imperial Disney groomer battalions? Well, you can, the short answer, uh, Henry, is that you can look at the um, virtue signal that we did today uh, uh, called uh, Who Owns Your Kids? I talked with Zoe about that. I started off by talking about, hey, you know, you Get Woke, Go Broke has just reached a new, um, new pinnacle. Not only are you going to go broke, uh, you are... Um, you're going to start paying a lot of taxes and deal with a lot of regulations you haven't had to deal with since you installed Disney, uh, Disney World in Orlando in the early 70s. Disney had uh, a, a carve out. When people don't realize this, Orlando is the number one tourist destination in the world now and has been really since the mid 70s, late 70s because of Disney World, which is astonishing. I went to Disney World probably 25 times before I went to Disneyland once I moved out into California. And when I got to Disneyland, I looked at Disneyland after having grown up in Disney World. And I said, that's not Cinderella's castle. That's Cinderella's tool shed. I mean, it's just the scale. It's just so much bigger. Anyway, the whole thing was nothing but swampland and, and, and scrub. And, and so in order to get it developed, Disney made a deal with the state of Florida with Claude Kirk, I want to say. I remember Governor Kirk when I first came to Florida. And... The deal essentially was, instead of having county administration, we're going to make this area that you bought, Disney, you're going to basically be your own government inside this. So you're not going to have, you're not going to have to worry about county governments or city governments. Or, you're just going to be, as far as legally, as far as works, you're going to be your own county. And that's what allowed Disney to pump all of the money they pumped into, because if they'd had to do all of this with all the regulations, even back in the early 70s, it probably couldn't happen. So they've had this exemption forever. They've had it since 1971, I want to say, 72, 73, something like that. Well, as a result of the people reimagining tomorrow and bragging about all the queer content that they're putting into their programming, uh, DeSantis said, you know what, let's take a look at this um, tax break that you guys have been living on for the last, you know, 60 years or whatever. And uh, here's a here's a uh, a tweet um, breaking. Florida Senate on a 23 to 16 vote just passed legislation ending Disney's tax privilege, self-governing power, and special exemption status. Awesome. Yeah, 50 years. I knew I was wrong when I said it. Awesome. This is how you. This is this is why I'm so cheerful. Uh, just. Uh, finished editing earlier today. It's either up tonight or tomorrow as as we record this. Uh, uh, the Moving Back to America called Slip Sliding Away. And it's like, these people are getting, they're not just losing, they're getting whipped. Whipped. Here, take a look at this. Um, these I should have handy. And they should be the right sizes. Where do I put them? I told you I'd have them handy. So, so handy means handy. Just, it's just to give you an idea. Here you go. Yeah. Take a look at this. No, wait a minute. Those aren't them. Hold on. Don't panic. I'm speaking to myself here. Did I put them here where they belong? Is that possible? Did I have done that? Why would I have done that? No. All right. Hang on. Hang on. It's worth it. It's worth it. I'll just find them around the desktop somewhere. I'm sorry. I hate the time slows down when you when there's dead air. It's it's it feels like centuries up here, and I'm sure it feels feels longer for you guys. Here's one. 
Okay, and here's the other. Yes. All right. All right. Um, I mentioned in the technocracy thing that historically, um, the wisdom of crowds that historically, uh, betting, uh, betting pools do a much, much better job of predicting actual election results than the best polls. Again, they do this consistently and with a much higher degree of accuracy for reasons I talk about in the technocracy thing. So here are screen grabs from earlier today um, that you might find uh, amusing. Uh, this is people who are putting their money down on, on this issue. This is people putting real money on it. Here's what the um, here's what the American public is a cross section of the American public thinks the chances are for a Republican versus a Democrat takeover of the House. And look at the trend lines. Every day, every day, it gets worse and worse and worse for them. Every single day, it gets worse and worse and worse. And that's the House. We, I don't think there's any question we're going to get the House. That usually happens regardless, you know, after the president's uh, first two years, they usually, the House usually flips and people come to their senses one way or another. But take a look at the Senate, uh, which, uh, which I will do right here. Same, uh, same thing, betting odds for the Senate. Look at that. Look at the trend line. Obviously, if you look back on March 2021, the Democrats had a significant, where the blue line's above the red, a significantly better than even chance of, of maintaining control of the Senate. And then it switched. And then look what happened starting in November of 2021, right? I mean, it just explodes. And I want to say that was probably around the, I don't know, was that Afghanistan? I don't know, inflation. But look at these numbers. They're, and, they're, and they continue to diverge like that. Uh, I want to know what happened right there on that vertical line. There were, well, it's probably a, you know, somebody input the data wrong. That's what happens in cases like this. Um, so all of this to say that um, these folks are in a heap of trouble, and they're in a heap of trouble because everything they do, they have to do in the dark, and they're not doing. It's not dark anymore. So I, I'll tell you, I know I'm going to get a lot of grief for this. Uh, I would, I would much rather see Ron DeSantis run, for, be the Republican nominee than Donald Trump. Uh, if for no other reason than the age issue, I think I think Donald Trump bought us a lot of time, and 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 I think if it had been Hillary Clinton, would have been unrecoverable. And I always liked him. Uh, there were times when I found him embarrassing, but I always liked him. I always thought he had America's best interests at heart, and I think he still does. But I happen to think that DeSantis is is the the is the guy. He's the he's he's just governing. Uh, you know, it might have something to do with the fact that he's a governor, but he's governing and he's governing well. He's making Florida in. He's, he, DeSantis is got, is running Florida so well that it's actually make it's actually a little bit embarrassing for for um, for Texas. You know, he's out he's out Texasing Texas. Um, so uh, I think he's fantastic. Um, I think I think he's fantastic. Uh, uh, if Trump wants to, uh, if Trump runs again, and he wants to run again, and he wants to run because he wants to beat Joe Biden, and uh, it's personal. And if he wants to run again, uh, I think we can all agree that it's not going to be uh, Mike Pence. If, if if we see a, a Trump Spence, uh, a, a Trump, um, uh, come on, DeSantis ticket, okay, I'm down. That's fine with me. Um, hey, we got to stop the show here. Uh, Taps556 says, Aloha, y'all. Sorry, this is a bit off topic, but I wanted to share a little good news with my fellow strata loungers. I got picked up for Staff Sergeant in the Army E6. Congratulations to you, Taps. Seriously, thank you for everything that you guys do. The sergeants are the, 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 the backbone not only of the Army, they're the backbone of the defense of this country. Honest to God, sergeants make the whole thing go round, and that's not news. Sergeants and, and, and petty officers, congratulations. Uh, E6 is a is a big big deal, and um, and I'm just super 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 proud to have you here as as part of the audience. Uh, super proud of you. Um, congratulations, and you're getting a lot of love from the comment stream, and I'm sure you'll get it in the uh, YouTube uh, comment section as well if you can get past the comments. Just probably ended up calling me a communist or whatever I am. 
But really, seriously, wonderful. Congratulations. Great news. So to answer your question, Henry, um, I think I think that DeSantis did exactly the right thing. And it's not just DeSantis. It's the it's the Senate, which means it's the people of Florida. The people of Florida just decided, oh, OK, so you're now you're bragging about how all these things that you're doing, that you're that you're doing without our knowledge or consent. You're bragging about this. Let's have a look at your tax status. Somebody's going to pay. You know, this is going to cost Disney billions and billions and billions of dollars. Is what it's going to is what that little is what that little boast is going to cost them. Um, and enough of this. You get enough of this stuff like like this, like Jeremy's razors. You fight back enough, and they fade. They don't just fade. They they fold. Is what I meant to say. Have you noticed these people never stand up and fight ever? They never fight. You're teaching critical race theory in schools. Yes, we are, damn it. We're teaching it because we believe in it and we think it's the right thing to do. No, never. It's like, well, we're not teaching critical race. Oh, no, 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 no. They run, 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 run. All you have to do is just, just stand there. You don't, have to, you don't have to fight them. You just have to stand there. Turn around and run. Eric Blake says, I want Ron DeSantis to remain Florida's governor until he finishes his second term. Well, who knows? Um, in any event, um, Again, congratulations, uh, Sergeant. Very, 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 very proud of you. Um, okay, this is from G.K. Masterson, who writes, uh, Hi, Bill. Please tell Natasha Apnoktok Bokpek for me. It's Pasha for us Orthodox folks this Saturday. Might mean Happy Easter or something. I don't know. For... Um, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, women can be so mysterious, you know, uh, with, with, uh, with their things. But I, I always love reading Cyrillic characters trying to pronounce them. That's what it looks like to me. Expanaktok Bokpek. Now, if this was spelled out in Roman characters, I could do a, a passable. I could make it sound well enough for her to understand what it is. Um, okay, so Big Booty says get to Facebook and uh, we'll do that. Uh, here's an admin note uh, about Discord. I'll have to deal with that after hours in the sidebar. Uh, I'm going to have to skip this one, too. I'm afraid it's a long question. Marsha, if you want to repost it, I, it just I'm going to have to move on to Facebook. It looked great. If you can post it next week in the comment section, I'll get to it first. So now we are going to move to Facebook because when Dave Big Booty says something, Dave Big Boutet says something, he says jump, I say how high, sir. And um, let's have a look at that. Uh, Christ is risen, thank you. Um, hey, look, there's Stratus for lunch. 11 comments. Let's see what they say. And I'm going to go looking for Dave Big Boutet. View nine more comments. Okay. Dave Olson. Oh, I can't talk to you, Dave Olson. I can't answer your question because I've got to find the one from Dave Big Boutet. See what I did there? Dave Olson. So, 50 years ago today, John Young and Charlie Duke took a, a spin in an open top roadster on the Descartes Highlands. Now there are plans to return, but unlike those first sojourns that took two small spacecraft, there's going to be one big honk and rocket. It reminds me of Von Braun's original plan that was rejected because it was, well, impossible. If anyone could pull it off, Elon can, but I have my doubts. It still seems like multiple ships for landing and return would be a better way to go. What are your thoughts on the new plans, and what would the ideal Whittle lunar base lunar mission look like? Well, it's very much like the old question. Uh, yes, so Apollo 16, uh, 50 years ago, they're driving around on the moon. Um, I just, when, when I saw Jeremy's commercial for Jeremy's razors, I, I went looking for something, uh, and I will go looking for it now because it's been too long. I hadn't seen it for years. And, uh, and so we will, we will go look for it right now. Give me a second. Um, hang on. It's related to the moon thing. And yeah, it's just fantastic. Yes, here it is. 
I showed this to Natasha. She just didn't get it at all. At all. Uh, but here it is for your viewing enjoyment. Stop there. Download this baby. It's, it's only a minute long. Downloading. Hey, that's new. Downloaded. Where are you, downloaded thing? Hang on, it's worth it, believe me, believe me. Most of you will recognize it when you see it, but some of you haven't seen it, and it's it's just fabulous. You said it was downloaded, but it... Is it? All right. Hang on. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, so I saw Jeremy's commercial, and, and I just thought it was so awesome that I sent him a link to this, because it, this is the last time I felt that good about a, a commercial. It reminds me very much of it. Here it comes. Here it comes. Come on, download. It's going to be at 720, so I'll scale it. For those of you who have not seen it before, uh, this is one of the greatest commercials ever. You'll see what, the, what connected me to it in a moment. Um, and, uh, yeah, I showed this to Natasha. She didn't get it all. I don't care. Here it comes. You lucky people. Why do we work so hard? For what? For this? For stuff? Other countries, they work, they stroll home, they stop by the cafe, they take August off. Off. Why aren't you like that? Why aren't we like that? Because we're crazy, driven, hard-working believers, that's why. Those other countries think we're nuts. Whatever. We're the Wright Brothers insane. Bill Gates, Les Paul, Ali. Were we nuts when we pointed to the moon? That's right. We went up there, you know what we got? Bored. So we left. Got a car up there, left the keys in it. Do you know why? Because we're the only ones going back up there, that's why. But I digress. It's pretty simple. You work hard, you create your own luck, and you gotta believe anything is possible. As for all the stuff, that's the upside of only taking two weeks off in August. Nespa? We went to the moon. You know what we got? Bored. We left the car up there, left the keys in it. You know why? Because we're the only ones going back up to get it. That's why. Um, yeah, it's a fabulous commercial. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, okay, so, uh, here's the thing about that. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave wanted to know what do I feel about, um, about the, uh, the, the Musk moon landing mission. I'm, I'm, look, I, I probably, uh, fanboyed enough on Elon Musk to last me for the rest of my life. I think he is the single most important human on the planet and by a wide margin and furthermore he's going to get us there when when nasa and the u.s government and the russian government and the chinese government and europeans can't do it he's going to do it so the question is how do i feel about the starship and and the landing and that kind of thing and the answer is i just hate it i hate it i hate it i hate it hate it hate it hate it and i hate it for the reasons that you mentioned i hate the starship landing on the moon thing and i hate the way the starship looks because to me, it looks like all of the designs that I grew up on that were then completely outdated and outmoded. To me, it, to me, the Starship doesn't look modern. It looks, it looks a, a little ridiculous, you know. When I first saw it, and and I saw the fleets of these things going to um, going to Mars, I thought, I'm kind of a module guy, you know, kind of a kind of a module guy. Um, it, it, it looks, it looks Buck Rogery. And I got to tell you, when I, it looks retro, I don't, I don't want my future to be retro. I'm tired of a retro future. I want my future to be you know, pro-tro. Um, it's, it's just strange. And, and, and it gives me mixed feelings. Now, with that said, when I watched, with that said, when I saw the, the Starship test from a year ago or whatever, and the thing's just coming down flat, and at the last second, it just kind of kicks itself over and just lands. Oh, that's pretty nice. And the and the the fins up front help a lot. Um, and and I and I've yet to see it on top of the booster. So when I see the whole thing stack, you know, it's going to be gigantic. 
And I remember when he first unveiled it, he said he's going with stainless steel. Is it stainless steel? Really? I thought we were in carbon fiber days now. I'm not going to argue with Elon Musk. He's doing it. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I just, there's something about it that just, I just bugs me. I guess it's just because probably bugged people to see the lunar module, I guess, if they'd grown up on Buck Rogers, see this kind of insecty, spindly looking thing. But that was, that's what I grew up with. That's what a spaceship's supposed to look like. We showed those renders of Aurora earlier. Um, and, uh, and Political Animal says, Bill, you're wrong on this, that the Starship is optimized as possible. There is nothing extra or unnecessary on Starship. I never said that. I never for a second said that Starship wasn't a great design. I never for a second said that the, that the Starship uh, was faulty or anything. I just said I don't like the way it looks. And I'm right about that. You don't have to agree with it, but I'm right about that. Uh, the, the, there's nothing... The thing is magnificent. When I heard that this thing is not only going to be bigger than the Saturn V, but is significantly greater lift, I thought, aces. I'm 100% I'm down with the Starship. I think the Starship, the whole Starship program is genius. I think it is... It is absolutely, absolutely magnificent. Aesthetically, it's not my cup of tea. Uh, but it doesn't have to be my cup of tea. And look, if, if they could get there, uh, you know, if they could get there using, if they could get there, you know, using a, a, a cast iron sphere that's got big old rivets on it like Titanic, okay, fine. Um, yeah, Eric's got it right. Bill just doesn't like the design because boomer moment. That's exactly precisely what it is. It's a boomer moment. No question. It's a boomer moment. I do have a concern about little things like center of gravity. That, I think, is a legitimate concern. When I see the, the, when I see the, the uh, artwork and I see the starship on the moon... They don't even have the leg support that, that, the, that the boosters have. So it's all pretty, um, you know, I was going to say it looks like it could blow over in a stiff breeze, but this is why Elon Musk is Elon Musk and I'm only Bill Whittle. You don't get a stiff breeze on the moon and you don't get earthquakes either, but there's something about it. It just, it looks precarious is the word. It looks precarious. It makes me nervous to look at this thing without some kind of a, of, a, of a serious set of landing legs. Now, if this thing had serious landing legs on it, objection withdrawn. But the thing just sits there like a stack of quarters, you know, and it's like, okay, he knows what he's doing. And, and I don't. So, um, but Dragon, on the other hand, as somebody pointed out in the comment, Dragon is, Dragon's awesome. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the lunar uh, political animal 87 says the lunar starship will have landing legs. Yes, but I think I've seen them, and I think they're just essentially just like you know things just to keep the the exhaust bells off of the dirt. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think if I I think if I continue if it had been a stainless steel future the whole way, I probably would be fine with it. I remember what, speaking of Disney. I remember one of the two or three things that changed my life, watching the Thunderbirds go into um, the Futurama exhibit at the World's Fair in 61 and watching the Von Braun animation on the Wonderful World of Disney on the, on the first space flight. If, if it had been stainless steel the whole way, I'd probably be fine with it. But when I, because if you haven't seen that, it's magnificent. Somebody asked, by the way, if I could post the link to the um, Cadillac commercial in the comment section, and I will do that now. Uh, actually, this should still be in the buffer, shouldn't it? Hey, there you go. Um, so in in the Von Braun thing that Disney did, this is a you know this is before we went into space. This is just just gigantic, you know, pretty steep look look more or less the dimensions of a traffic cone. And up on the top, you've got a winged vehicle, and you got all the astronauts inside. And you could tell they're astronauts because they all had different numbers, absolutely identical white guys, kind of drawn in a real stylized kind of way, look really cool. And they're all in these really cool suits, and they're in the, they're in their reclining couches and all this stuff, and it's like. Four, two, you know, number one, he's probably cap. Uh, and <laughs> off they went. And they went into Earth orbit. And I remember they, they would check their navigation thing. This guy's looking, he's got a, like a he's got an astrogation dome, and he's looking through these things, and these this is 1957 artwork. And these two little prisms came up from, from the hull. Two little prisms came up, and he's doing this and he's looking, and the prisms are kind of like and 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 
they're measuring the angle between two stars to get their relative orientation all the rest of it. Works great, but it's not exactly GPS, right? I guess that's kind of the point. Uh, the first, the first manned spaceflight, according to von Braun, was going to be in a in a reusable flying space shuttle that had a crew of I don't know, was it eight, ten, something like that. It wasn't going to be one guy in a phone booth, you know, metal phone booth. Um, uh, oh, Steve uh, Iceland says a uh, long story about that, by the way. It's called Man in Space. Uh, he said, Walt did a favor for Von Braun, who was needing to sell Apollo. Walt needed Von Braun, etc., to help produce that episode. That's when Disney was Disney. I, I, I couldn't couldn't believe it. Yeah, there's a, the, the Taurus Space Station, all that stuff. So you get all that stuff, right? And I'm thinking, oh, all right, yeah, okay. It's going to look like a you know, like, like an inner tube. And that's what, that's what I guarantee you, if, if Elon Musk does a space station, it's going to look like an inner tube. It's just going to be like, a, it's going to be perfectly smooth. It's going to be a stainless steel donut in space, and it's going to be magnificent, and it'll work great, and, and all that stuff. But if you start with that, and then you go, it's actually not even uh, Apollo. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's that stuff, right? I know you, you really have to pinch and stuff to see it zoom, but, uh, it's, 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 um, uh, 2001. Right, I'm 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 looking I'm looking at the starship and I'm saying where are all the greebles? Could you put some greebles on it? I mean, like you know, I almost said foam greebles because they wouldn't weigh much. But generally speaking, we've discovered that launching things covered in foam is not probably the best idea. Um, but no, but seriously, my design aesthetic in terms of what I expected the future to look like is 2001: a Space Odyssey, and and. That's all you need to know. I know what the moon land. If you if you'd asked me what he, what you should go back to the moon in, we should have gone back in the Aries, you know. Should have gone back in the big sphere, and then the landing gears retract, you know, and sets down on the moon. And, yeah, carry uh, 50, 60 people, and you got a stewardess gets to walk upside down and bring you your 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 you know your your sautéed cream peas or whatever. Anyway, there you go. Um, so. Yes, so there you go, Dave. Uh, that's the honest answer. I've never admitted it before. I'm probably going to be thrown out of the uh, future society, but it just, it's a boomer. It's a boomer moment. Joe Pomeroy, good morning. Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Joe. Thank you for catching up on most of those questions that I listened to today. The, the virtue signal, and it reminded me of something my dad told me. Wisdom is being able to address the things that you did wrong two years ago and change your life today to make it better. That is a brilliant way of looking at it. Here's another quote. Humility is knowing that in two years you'll be saying the same thing about what you're doing now. Brilliant. You need both wisdom and humility to be a decent person. One of the evolutionary traits of humanity is that young adolescent teens will be chemically and comically <laughs> called towards rebellion because this guarantees the largest net possible when covering bases and advancing the species. Yes. You want Kids, as soon as, especially young males, when they're old enough to be able to inflict physical violence and build things, you want to get them the hell out of there, which means that evolution has has given us a sense of, Mom, you know, you're embarrassing me. And that's when we try to teach them things, when they're in their most rebellious stage. That's brilliant. Um, every single generation is full of people saying, back in my day, and one of the reasons I'm looking forward to your work is because you have the wisdom to see where the young people are. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Dave Big Boutte says, knowledge is knowing tomatoes are fruits. Wisdom is knowing that they don't belong in fruit salad. There you go. Um, I, I mentioned this at the top of the show when I showed uh, the latest renderings. I think the quality of the work and the quality of the animation will go a long way to get people to either sign up to be members for this or make a donation so we can get it done. But that is absolutely secondary compared to the metrics. The metrics are mind-boggling. Uh, I'm going to have to redo them all because the ones I have are from 2017 or 2018. But really, if you look at a total views of the top five game show, top five gaming channels, and I did not include specifically, I don't think I included PewDiePie in that, you look at the top five gaming channels, the top five conservative commentary channels, 
look at those as total views, add them up, conservative commentary comes to 2%. 2% of the total, and that 2% is the 2% that already gets it and is getting older. And the 98% is available, and nobody's talking to that piece of the pie. No one. No one is talking to them. None. Um, not in the way that, that they want to watch it. So... The reason I've got knights and swords and monsters, and, and by the way, I've been doing so much of these monsters, my wife is just completely freaked out. Every time she comes into the, uh, the uh, my computer office at home, it's like you know, freaking guys with hooks through their faces, you know, and iron masks on. And Yeah, I'm trying to show this what Democrats do to people. <laughs> get away from me. Uh, get these things out of my house. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you, Joe. Those are very, very, very sweet things to say. Very nice comments. And, uh, and the, the, I've noticed, you mentioned wisdom and humility. I've noticed now that you mention it, although I never really thought about it before, uh, I certainly got it in this order and I suppose everybody else does. You get the humility first, right? That's, that's, that seems to me to be the way it works. You can't have the wisdom without the humility and they don't come together. You get the humility first, life beats the stupid out of you, and when you realize that everything you believe is nonsense, then maybe you can begin to uh, get enough perspective to you know, see things closer to the way they are. Um, but uh, t to whatever degree I've developed some wisdom, it's, it's only because the, uh, the humility came uh, first in, in large doses. Um, Richard Dark says people like Sargon, Tim Pool, Daisy Cousins, Candace Owens, and Lauren Chen carry the torch for young conservatives. Yes, but young conservatives are not the problem. They're not the problem. Um, all right, so moving on. Uh, thank you again for those, Joe. Eric Blake, we got two. Uh, uh, all right, I'll uh, let's just see if I can. I can get, my God, I can do it. Uh, I can do it. All right, so um, with the exception of Marusha Dark's uh, novel that she wrote on the uh, members only thing, if you repost that, I think we'll get through every one of the questions tonight. So we got a couple of Eric Blake's back to back. Uh, Eric and Blake, top fan says, Hey, Bill. Hey, Eric. Uh, so I've been thinking could Elon Musk's heroic endeavors inspire all those conservative investors and, my, whoops. And money men to finally start investing in the culture? Just a thought, but I'd hate to have to rely on our star man for everything. After all, he's just one man. So, and bear with me on this one. Uh, and by the way, it's a B E A R, as in bear, uh, not bear with me, like expose yourself, bear a load. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I didn't mean to. Just, I like collecting those kinds of things. Uh, so bear with me on this one. Uh, imagine, if you will, a group of conservative investors, perhaps led by Elon, buying up a big enough chunk of Disney to push it into reform. The stock sure seems to be plummeting last I saw. Maybe one Bill Whittle appointed as creative director. Absurd. No chance in hell. Maybe. But hey, Walt's legacy deserves far better than what it's getting. And like the man said, when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Elon Musk offered to buy Twitter is seismic, but his comments about Netflix are even more important as far as I'm concerned, which are very recent, last day or two. Netflix stock tanked by 40% or something like that. And um, I don't want to embarrass you. Uh, thank you, Marcia. Uh So their stock just tanked. And Elon said, maybe you shouldn't be doing so much woke garbage, you know? He said specifically, why can't you just make some good science fiction? And I just went, I can do that. I can do that, Mr. Musk. I can do that. And, I, and, and like I said, the first thing I want to say, Mr. Musk, because I know I, you got very busy, man. I don't want to spend a lot of time. You know? But I want to tell you, first thing out of my mouth, I just want it to be, I think the Starship is fabulous looking. It's the best looking vehicle ever. I thought, my God, we're not going to have to land on the moon with any of those crappy modules or anything. I mean, no, but no, we're going to get the sleek freaking monster out freaking love it. Way to go. Anyway, I want to talk to you about some money. Uh, so, um, is live, live uh, Eric Blake says, uh, is, is Elon preparing to buy up Netflix? I don't think he can continue to buy up all this other stuff. I did use an expression that I liked a lot. I don't remember where I used it. Did I use it in today's 
in the move back to America that goes up today? I think so. Um, I said, well, okay, so if this is what it takes, if it takes somebody, if it takes a, somebody rich enough to be able to buy free speech, then that's what we'll do. Okay. Uh, I did not see what you tweeted to Elon about about me. Did he answer? Um, the um, for him to say that, I just I just went, oh 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 no oh Mr. Musk Mr. Musk back here back here. No, not you again, kid. I did the um, I think I told you this. I did the uh, third season of American Built for Fox Business and. One of the subjects was the Kennedy Space Center. I said the closest I've ever come to being killed was at the Kennedy Space Center. The nearest I ever come to, to dying. I know how to tell these kind of things. It was stretch them out. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a near thing then. It was, it was, it was pretty close. I, guys thinking, about, were you there when a rocket exploded? It's like, no, I was on the, I was 13 years old. I was on the Red Tour and we were looking at all these historical sites and the bus drivers doing the running narration. And every time he said something, I just said, no, 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 no. That wasn't Apollo. That wasn't Apollo 3. No, no, no. That was Apollo five that launched from here, Apollo three launched from this other thing over here and, 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 and he came that close to, to killing me and, and he would have, and no jury would have convicted him. Um, thank you, Bart's Treasures. That's a sweet thing to say. I need to hear things like that, believe it or not. Uh, Bill, you don't need Musk. You'll do it on your own just fine. Thank you. Uh, I will not be able to, I'm not arguing with you. I will not be able to do it on my own. I'm going to need a lot of help. But if I can get that help, then we will get it done. And there's something, you know, there, uh, there's something hanging from my from my clothes here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, what is that? It's some kind of threadage. Thank you. Uh, thinking about this because I've talked with with Jeremy about it and and stuff, and and those discussions are ongoing. Um, but I gotta tell you, I think I really I really mean this. Because I, I, I haven't thought about this very much lately. If you grow up in entertainment, in the entertainment biz, then you know that everything comes down to one thing, and and everything else is is nonsense unless you get this solved. And that one word is distribution. If you can solve the distribution problem, you will get the money you need. Period. And if you don't, it doesn't matter how good your idea is or anything else. Distribution, distribution, distribution. So Daily Wire is obviously huge and getting huger every day. But it occurred to me that if you could if you could crowdfund this thing and you didn't and you didn't have to worry about a distributor. In other words, if you if your entire model was some of you out there give us money and we will make the entertainment you want to see, then you can really, 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 really go long, right? Really go long. Because then, um, uh, you, you know, I've talked about crowdsourcing aspects of it. And by the way, this just bears mentioning since you brought it up, um, Eric. So here's a concern I have. Um, I relatively recently, in this last year or two, a little over a year, I guess, maybe, maybe almost two now, uh, I got really into uh, Warhammer 40k, which for those of you unfamiliar with it, was originally a tabletop game with miniatures, but it's about this dystopian future that is more dystopian than anything has ever been dystopian before. Uh, it out dystopiates dystopia. It's, it's appalling. And, and it, that's what's fun about it is it is so unbearably bleak in the grim darkness of the far future, there will be only war. That's their motto. The grim, grim darkness. So grim dark is now an adjective, right? I have a, I've got, a, I'm working on a grim dark project. Um, all hail the emperor, beloved by all. Uh, so I really got into it. I read the whole Horus Heresy series of novels. It's like 60 novels. I read them all. Just bang. Just, 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 I read eight hours a day. And, and here's the thing I'm getting at. It's true for 40K. It's certainly true for Star Wars, and it's, true for, and it's true for Star Trek. Star Trek was created by Gene Roddenberry. Star Wars was created by George Lucas. Both of them, it's impossible to imagine those products without them, but 
it's also impossible to imagine that Roddenberry or Lucas could have done all of the work that makes those, uh, those fictional universes so real. That's why there's so much texture in them, right? The reason that there's so much texture in, in Star Wars or Star Trek or 40K is because you've got dozens of authors and thousands of fans, and they're all just sketched in little details, right? So you, so you read this story, and where did these details come from? One guy thought about the little details here, and he's not worried about the big picture and all the rest of it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm 63, you know, I gotta get going here, so how do we get that texture there? And I thought, well, maybe we could crowdsource that too. Here's the question I have for the, uh, for the, um, for the live audience and also for, the, uh, for those of you playing at home on YouTube. I am convinced that it would be possible for, for the colonies, for the science fiction series I want to do. I, I'm convinced it would be possible to, to cover this legally but I'm not sure I can cover it emotionally. Here's my concern. If I had a contract or a legal structure that basically said, look, if you want to contribute to this, uh, to this background, to this universe, we not only will, will allow you, we'd love to have you, but there are two important critical things that you agree to by checking this box or whatever. The first one is is that is that you immediately realize that you cannot get paid for it because there's no way we can, can, can track the accounting. It's not that I wouldn't want to pay you for it. It's just that we cannot track the accounting. So whatever work you do on this, you're doing out of love of the project and you are not being compensated for it. Your compensation is a credit or whatever the case may be. That's fairly straightforward. Here's the one, here's the one that really, really concerns me. In order for this to work, it's... Look at the second 32 series. Huh. I don't know what that is. Uh, if you can send me a link, uh, Cody, that'd be great. Um, so, so here's my concern. Legally and, and financially, I'm sure we can find a way to make that happen. But for this to work, somebody, and that means me, has to say yes or no. Right? There's got to be somebody that says yes or no. Because if, if, if everything is a yes then yes uh, thank you marcia by the way it's a little early for that but but yes but i'm not concerned about the legal structure here's my here's my concern it has to be yes or no this belongs in this universe or it doesn't it may belong somewhere else but if you if you want to introduce space marines into this thing i'm saying no no this is not this is not that it's not that future i'm i can cover it legally can i cover it morally in other words how many people are going to be angry because it didn't get approved. Now, I think I can approve stuff way before you do the majority of the work, but I'm, I'm really genuinely concerned that somebody puts in a lot of effort and, and it's like, you know, look, I, I see a lot of 3D models. I look at a lot, a lot of 3D models all the time. And, um, and if you go to like CG Trader or Turbo Squid or something, you're gonna find that for every hundred assets 95 of them are, well, 90 of them are garbage. Five of them are pretty decent. Two or three are very good, and two are fantastic. So Marusha says, yes, I'm the editor-in-chief, the producer. Yes, exactly, that's what I am. But if I had to look at it from, a, from the point of view of, of if I was running CG Trader or any of these other 3D sites where you can buy assets, I would cut 90% of the content on that on that website and they don't because it's not their job to right nobody knows what what people are going to want and i wouldn't cut anything that i disagreed with some of it's just garbage in fact a lot of it's just plain garbage just garbage and there's so much garbage you have to just sift and sift and sift so i'm i'm concerned about about saying no to people because i would have to say no to a significant number of things now we could release a, a, a Bible, make that public, public domain. Not just public domain, just here it is. If you want to contribute to this, fantastic. You're going to have to agree to the terms of the contract by clicking on the thing and blah, 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 all that stuff. And this will help you not to go down any wrong paths. The reason I'm doing this is so that you can create paths that I'm not creating or that I'm not even thinking of. It's open, I've seen Sketchpad. It's, uh, it's open source, right? I understand that thousands of people or hundreds of people, tens of people can do much, much more really great stuff than I can do. But 
since they're not talking to each other, there's got to be a, a, a filter to keep it all the way you do it. So you put out a Bible that basically is, here's what the show's about. Here's things that are off the table, right? If you give us, if you give us uh, anti-gravity, if you give us uh, fashion, you know, if you, if you give us any of, of these things, it's out. Uh, and when it comes to things like names, if you want to name a planet, you know, Delphinor, I'm not going to name any of the major planets Delphinor. If you want to, millions of moons and asteroids, you want to name one of those Delphinor, okay. But if you, but if you, like I was, funny, I was thinking about this on the way in. Um, what, were the, what was the example? Um, ah, it's just this kind of thing that, that I think about when I'm driving to work. I'm pulling into the garage here today to come in and do the virtue signals. And I was thinking about this exact issue about would it hurt people's feelings and how would I know if something felt like it belonged or not? And just on the top of my head, I thought, what if there were like a, a twin pair of asteroids, like, uh, you know, a, a binary, and uh, or twin moons, something like that. And their real names are, you know, Penelope and, you know, Procyon, some, some official names. But their nicknames are Gasket and Casket. Because one of them is where all of the... Uh, the good stuff is, and the other one is where people get killed in, in industrial accidents trying to get the other stuff. So their real names are this, but their nicknames are Gasket and Casket. And I thought, that's fabulous. That's the kind of thing I love. Yes, Marisha Dark and Fiery Waco. Planet McPlanet Face, this is the problem. What if they call it Planety McPlanet Face? No. We put all this work into it. I know you did, and I feel bad about it. I do. I genuinely do. I guess as long as you know up front, right? And, I, and as somebody pointed out, several people pointed out the idea of a, of a, a Bible, which for those unfamiliar with the term, the, the, a show's Bible is the, um, the rules of that particular show. And they're given out to writers uh, who are hired to work on the shows. And what Star Trek Discovery and Picard and stuff tells me is that the Bible for those shows has nothing to do with science at all. There's not a speck of science in any of those things. Here's our here's our political agenda. Here the here's what we want to turn people into. Right about that, but you know, sonar in space and all of the warp drive, uh, all of warp technology is gone. What happened? All the dilithium crystals were were destroyed. That's quite an achievement. How do you destroy crystals over thousands of light years and and hundreds, if not thousands, of cultures? This is the standard technology. How do you destroy all the dilithium crystals in the galaxy? Was there some kind of war? No, no. What happened was this guy who's kind of psychic. Psychic? Yeah, yeah, he's kind of psychic. Well, he had like a really bad day. Uh huh. So, so he, he had this really bad day and, and he had this primal scream. He just went, ah! Yeah. And that scream went through the galaxy and destroyed all the dilithium. So we don't have any, any uh, star flight anymore. I would have looked at this and said, <laughs> well done. Bravo. Yeah. Bravo. Fantastic. Now, what's, what, what have you really got? No, that, that's, that's not only discussed, that's canon for Star Trek Discovery. That's what happens in the far future. Some guy, some alien, has an emotional outburst, and the emotional energy waves from this spread out and destroy all the dilithium in the universe. You know, you should be flogged for that. I mean, not just fired. You should be flogged. And I'm not talking about the writers either. I'm talking about the I'm talking about the people that 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 allowed this to 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 go into it. I mean, just think about this. It's a great example, right? So Discovery, which is garbage. It's not Star Trek. It's nothing like Star Trek. Star Trek is optimistic. This is dark, depressing, mean, just like the left. It's the it's the left, depressing. So. Uh, the um, this this kind of the, the people don't know anything about science, but take but take the word dilithium, right? That's a that's a, undoubtedly a Roddenberry term. There's no such thing as dilithium, but there sounds like there could be. And if you said it's a dilithium crystal, and you think well, you just you just swallow it. And the reason you swallow it without a without a second guess is dilithium sounds like something that could exist. A dilithium crystal sounds like it's something that could exist. 
because those two terms are chemical terms. And that's very, may sound extraordinarily tiny, right? Extraordinarily tiny. But it's not. It's the essence of everything. Yes, great point, Dave Big Booty. Um, dilithium and tritanium, these are, these are terms that are written by writers who have some fundamental appreciation of science. That's why they call it science fiction and not just fiction. So when you have Star Trek Discovery where they've got sonar in space, it's not just a question of, gee, that's kind of dumb. It's a question of throw the TV out the window. They throw, just throw it out the window. It just, just throw it out. Yes, and Bart's Treasures points out, so this is probably the best example. Same with phasers. Roddenberry originally wanted to go with lasers, but he thought, lasers, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I have the kind of power, and maybe, you know, we're starting to, because they're just starting to experience lasers in the 60s, right? So uh, we need something a little more than lasers. Um, how about um, something, you know, what about phasers? What? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a energy beam, and it, and it, and it, and it, it's in phase with something, and it, it disintegrates it, because a laser just punch a hole in it, but a phaser will disintegrate it. Phaser. Phaser's one of the, phaser's one of the, best science fiction terms ever. In fact, I think phaser is the best science fiction term of all time. A phaser is a fantastic, fantastic name. And, um, and the fact that, that you would design something that looks this cool, right? Which is, which is, okay, this looks like a gun, right? You've got a gun. You can tell it's a gun because it's got an end and you hold it like this. But the fact that this thing also, I'll do this without destroying it, I haven't touched in 10 years or five or three or whatever. And I come on, this way. I'm embarrassing myself now. I don't want to destroy this thing. I don't want to break it. But I also... Oh, well. Suffice it to say uh, that this is a phaser two. That the actual phaser is this black device, which is about the size of a garage opener. And, you, and then... If you want to add some juice to it, you punch it into this baby, and off you go. And if you really want to add some juice, you add it to the, to the phaser rifle. See, this is internally consistent. Now, somebody said something earlier that, that I thought was right on point. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's not terribly important. It's just you just thought it was spot on for the issue. Uh, boy, it's amazing how fast the comment stream goes. Okay, so somewhere in there, somebody said, what if somebody wanted to name a planet B17984? I thought, sold. Perfect, yes. Why is it B? If you can tell me why it's B, even better. But B17894, fantastic. That's what a, that's what a space rock sounds like it would be to me. Um... So yeah, so there you go. Um, anyway, uh, that's that. So uh, let's see. Um, we got to the Eric Blake one. All right. So I said I could do them all I can. So there's four to go. Eric Blake, part two. Andy writes, Hell Vectron Citizen Whittle, my Vectron's claw point its way to the restoration of California so that no one here will try and guilt you to move out any longer and make, make Vectron's golden claw make it so. Now, in a Virtue Signal episode a little while ago, you and Zoe focused on Beggar Man Thief, and a thought occurred to me. I think an interesting concept to dwell on for a bit would be a professional thief who went that way because he or she doesn't want to be a beggar. See, as far as the thief is concerned, at least being a successful thief requires a constant use of intelligence, innovation, and creativity. Therefore, it, is essentially, it essentially points to the thief being in control of his or her life, as opposed to, well, always having to depend on the kindness of strangers. What do you think? Interesting question, as usual. Here's what I, here's what I think. Uh, there are no smart thieves. There are... If you, if you take a situation, one of the things, one of the most important books I ever read ever, ever, is uh, called The Coroner. And it's about the inner city Baltimore uh, drug scene in the 90s. It's gotten worse since then, but it's, 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 a, it's a must read if you really want to know what's going on out there. And the, the point that's pretty clearly made, he's not making this point, it's just what you come away with, is that if you've got a situation that's as dysfunctional after 100 years of democratic rule as, as, uh, as 
um, downtown Detroit, uh, uh, Baltimore is, you have a choice. You can either become welfare dependent and, and get your checks and have nothing to do all day forever except for going out and smoking crack, which is what I would do if I found myself in that situation. Or, or you can sell the crack, in which case you can make a lot of money, but your risk goes way up. And you also run the same risk of becoming addicted. You know, don't get high on your own split. Uh, and so in, in, in a situation like that in inner city Baltimore, the smart people, the people with initiative, the people who would be businessmen, really successful businessmen in the, in the real world, they're, they're in crime. That's what they do. Uh, because there's nothing else for them to do. You're either selling it or you're buying it, and you're either making money or you're or you're or you're stealing money, you're ripping out electrical cables out of the wall so you can get your you get your hit today. Uh, and he talks about things like how in the morning when these guys first come out, you know, they they they, they, they come out and they've got um oh, what's the term he uses? Uh, um, oh, it's such a cool term too. It's a street term. It's a real term. Um, Somebody will tell me. Uh, it's the lowest, lowest level of the of the drug dealing uh, hierarchy, and they're the people that come out and they talk about how great the stuff is today in exchange for a hit. It, they call them uh, it's like promoters. It's a um, that's the nice thing about this. It's like having a very, very slow AI. It takes me eight whole seconds to get the answer. Um, it's it's not temps. It's 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 a short form for somebody who promotes something. Um, Oh, it's so close. Anyway, no, not pushers. Um, God, I, I, it's like right there. Uh, anyway, these are the um, these are the guys who are a little bit higher functioning, and and they get they get a, a vial early in the morning, and that gets them a hit. And then their job is to go out and and hawk these things. They're not really even selling them. They're going, oh, these latest red caps are, are amazing. Not peddler either. It's um, it'll come to me. No, it's a, it's a, it's short for another word. It's short for like an advocate. It's mm, it's a great term. Um, This is just because I'm going to lose my mind if I don't get this. Um, nope, bagman, nope, mover, nope, candyman, nope. It sounds so much like temp, temp. Hang on. I'm just, I just gotta find it now. Touts. That's it. No, is it tout? No, maybe not. I don't know. I, it'll come to me. Whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm wasting too much time on this. Um, but anyway, uh, um, it's so much like it might be touts, but it might be touts. Yeah, it might be. Um, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, so anyway, um, whatever it is. So in this kind of, in this kind of, very enclosed environment where there's essentially no escape except for the fact that you know you could just drive away but you have to have a sense that there's something beyond that in that city that and they don't they don't and um so in in that kind of an environment your 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 brightest people are usually the criminals but in the real world there are no smart thieves I'm excluding the financial sector. Um, what I mean by that is, um, when I when I was growing up and, and 
pretty young, there was a, a genre of movies, and it was the master thief genre, the, the, the cat burglar, you know. This guy's like an internationally famous fashion photographer or something, and he goes around and steals like the most, the most valuable uh, jewelry, you know, in the world, and, and he'll leave his, his calling card with, with a black velvet glove on the scene, you know. Oh my God, the Hope Diamond is missing. Here's, here's, um, you know, here's a, a card, and, it's, and the guy's name is Jack of Hearts, you know. This master criminal things. Um, uh, no, it's, it's touts, touts. So they, they're basically here. Here's a small hit. Go out and tell everybody that the blue caps are really good today. Touts. That's the word. Um, so all of this kind of master criminal thing. But there are no master criminals because there's no reason to be a master criminal. If you're, if, you, if you're smart enough to be a master criminal, then you're smart enough to not have to go into crime. One of the things that, that's most remarkable about most criminals, really, to, to regular people is, well, let's come out and say it, is, is how stupid they are. In, in many cases, they're so stupid that they, they can't even really fully appreciate the consequences of their deal. Here's a, here's a you know, an iPad sitting on a table, and I could take that and run. On the, they, but it never occurs to them that, you know, you got a room full of people here, and there's two cops in the corner, and, you know, and, and, and you're, you could maybe, you know, get 10 or 20 bucks for that, but you could also get 10 or 20 years, you know. Yeah, touts is in touting. Um, so, so... Crime is for losers, and um, and there are no master criminals. Now, of course, I'm talking about the Great Reset, so I'm talking about, yeah, master, master criminals. By the way, uh, going to the Great Reset, uh, this, this series of firewalls, I think the next one I'm going to do is going to be um, Homo Deus. Homo Deus, Homo Deus, Homo Deus. Uh, but... When, when the whole thing seems incredible to you and, and can't possibly be true, which is where I've been battling the last two years, is this can't be, this can't be court, this can't, it can't be, it's too complex, it's too big, it's just, it's, 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 it's fever, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're really losing it. Um, the, uh, when Din I interviewed Dinesh D'Souza for his movie on Hillary, I think it was, no, it was a book. It was a book he wrote while he was doing jail time for the minor, minor, minor unintentional violation of election laws that he did while, meanwhile, the whole electoral system is, you know, nuts. But I was interviewing Dinesh on his book, and the, and the first paragraph of this book is basically this. He said, if you are inclined to be a thief, if you are of a uh, larcenous mindset, and you wanted to steal something, What's the most valuable thing in the world? I thought, you know, I never thought of it. If you're gonna go, if you're gonna be a thief and, you, and you're ambitious, why not go large? If you were gonna steal, if you were gonna steal something, what's the most valuable thing there is in the world to steal? And he said, the most valuable thing in the world is the private property held by Americans. Seventy-two trillion dollars is what, and this is ten years ago now, five, ten years ago. $72 trillion worth of value, that's what private property, private savings, and, and, and all, of the, all of the privately owned stuff in the U.S. comes to $72 trillion. And he said, now, if, you, if you're going to steal stuff, that's where you want to go. And, I, and that was years and years ago. Now when we get to this Great Reset thing and all of these people like Schwab and all the rest of it, BlackRock, and oh, this can't be possibly connected. They're making a pretty good attempt to go after what is the most valuable thing in the world. And I have to tell you, as far as the, uh, you know, how they can't possibly all be in on this, I saw a meme that blew my mind. Um, <laughs> it's a father on a bench sitting there next to his kid, and the, and the kid says, uh, Dad, is Santa Claus real? real? Some kids said he's not real, and and the dad says, "Of course Santa Claus is real. If he was a fake, I think how many people would have to be in on this." I thought, "Wow, man, that little statement right there is really pretty powerful. Pretty powerful." Um, 
even in this society, I have not seen anybody who's got the conviction of the nerve to go up to kids, you know, little kids before Christmas while they're toy shopping and say, none of that's real, none of that's all. I'm not even going to say it out loud because I happen to think that Belief in Santa Claus is, uh, is one of the foundational bedrocks of American society. I'm, and I'm not kidding either. I think the whole thing is absolutely beautiful. I think the whole, I think the whole thing is beautiful. Um, so, anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's what the most valuable thing in the world is if you're going to steal it. So, um, so uh, th I don't think there are any uh, Master Thieves, um, Eric. I, I just think it's a, I think a Master Thief is, uh, is an is a invention of bright people to entertain other bright people. But um, I, I just don't think they exist. It is, as I said, it is true that in, in, in a kind of an enclosed environment where there's essentially no escape, then you will find that the smartest people go to crime because there are no other options. But in the, in the larger world, there's no reason to be a criminal. The risk is just too great. You make one mistake and you're, 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 you're gone. You know, you're, you're in prison for five years, ten years. I, I, just imagine being in prison for five years. That's a relatively light sentence for professional criminals. right? You know, I'm going to do a nickel or whatever they used. It's five years of your life gone. It's inconceivable. There's nothing I would do that would that would put that at risk. Nothing. I really, I just, I can't. It's the famous last words in the last episode before the big extortion trial uh, begins, or whatever. It's not extortion. Um, the other thing. Three to go. Eduardo Henrique. Hello, Eduardo. Long time no see. Greetings, Bill. Wazer thirteen here. Oh, no, no, no. How about that? I had not made the connection. Uh, although I'm sure you mentioned it before. I have not been able to check TSL Live because I finally left Germany and got myself an engineering job in the aeronautics industry at Shannon, Ireland. Hurrah! 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 Tovarici! Congratulations, Wazard. I know it's been something really, really tough there for you. Um, that's wonderful. So second uh, round of congratulations, the first one for the Sarge earlier, and, and that's just great news. Uh, it sounds like a great job. Just being out of the stifling control freak German state is such a relief, and the job is great to design airplane electrics and avionics. will do my best to watch when possible. The time zone in my morning shift makes it a bit tough. Best regards and best of luck. You came in earlier. I didn't know you had a question on Facebook. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Sincere, sincere congratulations. Uh, and I think in the, um, in the live stream, uh, I, I glanced over and said, uh, you, you're working at Shannon. Uh, in Ireland and had I ever been there. I'd been in Shannon for about half an hour when I was uh, 16. I went to visit my grandfather in London and they had just deregulated the airline industry. I was living in Miami and a, and a company came out called International Air Bahamas and I think they had a jet, maybe two, but they were offering round, they were offering round trip from, from Nassau to London $220 in 1976. Uh, all right. So we flew from, so I flew a Cessna 172, not by myself, with another guy and a, and a friend. We flew from Miami to Nassau, which was interesting. Waited in Nassau for six, seven hours on the ground. Nassau to Luxembourg, waited in Luxembourg for seven, eight hours on the ground, then Luxembourg to London, and then on the way back it was London to Shannon, and then Shannon to Miami, I think. I think. Um, so that was the only time I've ever uh, set foot in Ireland. It was certainly a beautiful country. Uh, I remember just being very, um, just very impressed with Ireland, but I, I can't say I spent any time there. Um, I, I, I think the, uh, you make a pretty strong case that uh, the Irish are certainly in the league of the top three peoples in the world who punch above their weight in terms of their cultural impact. Right? Uh, there's just something charming about them. And, and I think the thing I like most about the Irish is the willingness to make fun of themselves. And that's why this whole mascot thing, you know, somebody said the Cleveland Indians have been renamed to the Cleveland, what is it now, the Cleveland Defenders or the Protectors or some such ridiculous thing like that. You don't, you don't get passionate and, and feel a sense of ownership about things you despise. You don't name your, your baseball team, your football team after things you despise. 
But since the left is determined to exterminate any sense of Indian uh, references at all in the country, uh, so, you know, okay. But you don't hear Irish people complaining about the, um, the fighting Irish uh, uh, mascot. You don't hear them complaining about the Boston Celtics um, mascot. Right? I mean, they're both, they're, they're both leprechauns. It's, it's, you could very easily take offense at this if you were one of those people that made a living taking offense at things. We're not all short, you know. We don't all wear bowler hats and have little canes. You kind of do, don't you, though, really? Like, don't, 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 don't spoil it for me. The Cleveland Guardians. Okay, well, that's, that's sure. What else? I mean, why not, right? The, 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 this is why in, my, in the colonies, I want the Earth government to be, it's not going to be the Earth Empire, and it's going to be something like the, um, the Terran, Terran Administrative Zone. I want something just bureaucratic and, and absolutely formless, tasteless, and lifeless. Um, the Washington Commanders, you know, it's, it's what it was, did they rename? Because the, it was the Washington football team, right? Ooh, that's pretty meta, post postmodern kind of thing. The Boston Celtics, not the Celtics. Yes, that's right. It's the Celtics. Technically, it should be the Celtics. I've never heard them called that. The Washington team. Okay, great. Lucky Charms. Somebody, uh, Aesop's pointed out Lucky Charms. Yes, they're magically delicious. Aye, it's a leprechaun. And and the reason that people don't react this way that the Irish don't react this way is because the Irish have a sense of humor and they have a sense of humor because they've got some kind of confidence. They don't have to be offended by things because it doesn't hurt them. You know, this is the whole thing. We talked about wisdom and, and humility earlier. It's like the, the Irish make fun of the fact that, that, that they, that they drink and fight, that, that all the, they owned all the slurs that were, that were leveled against them probably because there's a fair amount of truth to it. Like there is with a lot of these things. And, and they just they just ran with it and 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 everybody loves it that's why there's a saint patrick's day in america right i mean how what percentage of this country is actually irish or even of first or second generation irish descent nothing but all of boston politics northeastern politics all run by the irish the kennedys all of this stuff right so um so they own it and and what, what happens on saint patrick's day well they all get up go out and get drunk and drink green beer because ireland is green swell and you don't hear any Irish people out there saying this is a disgrace, and I'm and I'm mortified, and we're not, you know, we're more than just leprechauns, and how dare we, you know, just honestly, honestly, you know, when I hear jokes about, you know, like white people and things like, you know, they find, you know, they, they had to invent mayonnaise because, you know, they because ketchup was too spicy, you know, that kind of thing. I find that hilarious. I I just find that really hilarious, and and. That's probably because I don't have a you know, big insecurity issue about that. Um, anyway, yeah, paddy wagons, that's right, all that stuff. Good for them. Good on them. Hey, here we go. Um, congratulations, Eduardo. Very, very happy to hear it. And the last two questions that I'm geared up for in order to complete my task are not even questions. Graham, Ga Graham Godfrey says, and now for something completely different. And there's a reply there, which is probably a nine-part reply that I have to have. Oh. Always look on the bright side of life. Yes, Monty Python changed the world. And then the last uh, issue here is from Andrew. That was from Graham Godfrey and Joe Pomeroy. And the last one is from uh, Andrew Wallace, who says, love your attitude. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if you're watching, but honestly, I know this sounds reflexive, but it's not. It's real. I really need to hear these comments. Comments like this really make a huge, huge difference. Um, it really, really makes a difference. Uh, thank you. That's about all I can say for it, really, honestly. It's it's just great. Um, so anyway, um, I guess that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, well. Oh, well. Uh, saints preserve us. You gotta love them. Um, I love the Scottish, too. And I'm English. Not British. English. Although I'm plenty close to Scottish. We're all from Lancashire. We're all right up there in the northwestern corner, just south of the border where all the coal is. 
That's where we come from. My family is uh, from Wiggum. And I was surprised to find out that George Orwell wrote a book called um, something, The Wigan Pier, Journey to the Wigan Pier, or Road to the Road to Wigan Pier, something like that. It's about um, coal miners, and that's that's who I'm descended from. I'm proud of that. It's as low as you get, you know. I mean, it's in the, it's, 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 it's it. You know, these these coal miners. Orwell talks about things like this. These guys would have when when they would be. Um, if you if you saw one of them changing that all of the bones on their on their spine were black it's because they're crouching over you you think you get down in the elevator you start mining coal no 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 you get down in that elevator and then you have to walk for 2 miles sometimes underground then you start mining stuff and they were scraping their backs against the, the coal mine and they basically got tattooed by it they would have they would have tattooed the road to Wigan Pier yeah they would have tat black marks on their face and what these black marks are they're 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 banging away at the coal and the coal chips would fly into their skin and get under their skin and then heal now you've got now you've got you know coal freckles and you know black lung disease and all the rest of that stuff and 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 when we did the family history we found out a lot of these and I, when i say house i don't mean a house i mean like little like row houses like duplexes like the, that kind of thing out back, there's just holes in the ground, and people are mining their own coals in their own backyards because they can't afford, you know, to cut costs. Just dig a hole and start pulling up the coal out. Uh, one of my favorite stories ever. I love these kind of things. Uh, I love I love finding out where expressions come from. That's why I was being such a a Nazi about the bear with me uh, because it's not uh, it's not these are my old um, stomping grounds. It's these are my old stamping grounds, and you're not chomping at the bit, you're champing at the bit. It's important to get these things right. Uh, the expression, uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, most people don't know what that means, but that comes from, basically comes from coal miners. You get a bath once a week, and it had to be hot. It had lye soap, and it had to be hot, because you've got this grimy dirt deep inside you. And dad goes first, because dad is by far the dirtiest. So he has to have the hottest water. And you can't just turn on the hot water. you got to pump the water, put it into this thing, and you got to heat it. It's an it's a all-day-long event. So dad gets into the hot water, and he baths himself up. Mom comes in second. The water's already black and filthy and so on. And all the kids come in afterwards, and there's 11, 12 kids, right? And every single time, they're using the same water. You can't just drain it and turn water on again. That's a modern invention. All the way down to the last of the little kids, and by the time you're washing the baby, the water is India ink. It's absolutely pitch black from coal dust and all the filth from the 11 people, cold and, and all the rest of this stuff. The water is so black and so opaque that when you're washing the baby, you don't want to lose it. You don't want to let go of the baby because if the baby disappears, it's going to disappear into this black ink, and you could throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's how that works. Um, we used to live in a hole in the street, a hole in the street that would have been paradise for us. Four Yorkshiremen is one of the greatest comedy sketches of all time. If you haven't seen it, watch Four Yorkshiremen, look for it on YouTube, and look for the black and white version with John Cleese, uh, Graham Chapman, and then this other guy, and it might have been Marty Feldman. Uh, Four Yorkshiremen is, is, is one of the greatest sketches of all time. It's absolutely, it is. Just, uh, I just want to watch it right now. Um, okay, uh, that'll do it. Hey, guess what? Time for, uh, time for this one. Even Rosin, Rosin, Rosin. Time for this one to go home, something like that. From, was that from, Mr. was that Mr. Wizard? It wasn't Peabody and Sherman, I don't think. Oh, my God. Whatever. All right, so, um, you know, we used to have to clean the street with our tongues. Uh, luxury. Yeah, and John Cleese, I mean, listen to the... Right, well, Dad would feed us a plate of cold poison. <laughs> went to bed, went to sleep at 8.30 in the morning, four hours 
after we got up something like this. It's marvelous. Just marvelous. All right, I got to go. Um, thanks again uh, for uh, being with us here, and uh, thanks for all the kind words. As usual, got through all the questions. Marusha, I owe you one, so we'll get to that first next time. Um, uh, <laughs> cold poison. <laughs> Privilege. Would have, would, we would have been grateful for cold poison. Uh, the show's made possible by the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, and you know who you are. And uh, we know who you are, too. And we're very grateful, as always. Uh, and um, and that'll do it. So um, we will see you uh, presumably next Thursday for the Thursday show. I am discussing taking next week off. Uh, I don't know if that will include this show. I don't know yet. I'm thinking about it. Uh, we'll see. But in any event, uh, new Moving Back to America is either up now or will be up by tomorrow morning. So there's that. And... Um, I'll either see you next week or the week after, but it's looking a lot like next week. All right. Thanks, gang. Uh, great seeing you. And, um, you know, stay frosty. <laughs>